questions, comments, insults even sometimes we get, and uh, we'll do our best to address all of those. Today on camera, jean Dre, there is his thumb, and Richard playing Ranger in the back of the car with us. <laughs> Richard is there, of course, because we will be out after dark, and so he's here just to look after us, make sure we don't misbehave, and make sure nothing else misbehaves in our general vicinity. Also out on drive, Jamie Patterson. Brent has managed to break his car, I'm not sure how, uh, so he is struggling to get any sort of signal out towards us at the moment, so we may or may not hear from him today. A three feed drive from the Mara or two feed at the moment. Uh, we're just going to have a quick look at how the atmosphere here has turned quite well. I don't know if it's dusty or sort of cloudy, but certainly there is some weather blowing in. And I shall also tell you, of course, that Alice, aka Siri, is directing today and she's being ably assisted by Faith who begins, and I don't mean the, that in the spiritual sense, I mean there's a human being called Faith who is going to start her mm, directing next week. She's very nervous, she's terrified. Probably a good thing. Right, then over there we have some elephants walking through the forest. Shall I just reverse slightly, Jandri? Or are you happy there? He's not speaking anymore, so I'm just going to stay here until he shouts at me and tells me to move. And I find watching these elephants walking through these woodlands, well, I just think it's a rather peaceful thing to look at. There's some baboons in there as well. The olive baboon. An olive baboon rather than the olive baboon. And we've got waterbuck here, defessa waterbuck. The Grant's zebra, as I told you. And some glorious light after a day that has been, well, I think I can safely say white lit. It has been very blindingly bright, but it's starting to change. Now, Jamie Patterson is putting me to shame already, which is uh, distressing to my person. So I'm going to hand you across to her with uh, something that doesn't have stripes, but it has got spots and it is so very fast. James must absolutely not be distressed. He didn't have to suffer through this morning's events where Fergus and I started off on an absolute roll and then couldn't find the cheetah the entire afternoon. But, I mean the entire morning. But it is the afternoon and we have found them. All five of the musketeers wandering straight towards us. What a fantastic way to start off the sunset safari. Before they get too much closer, quick introduction. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Fergus is on camera with me. And we're very, very excited because we've been really looking forward to finding these cheetah. And we didn't succeed this morning as I said, but we've got them now. So don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. This is only the second time that I've actually spent a long period of time with these five boys, so I'm very excited, and we will definitely be staying with them once it gets dark. My only concern is the sheer horribleness of the weather this afternoon. I don't know what James is experience across, experiencing across the river, I can tell you that it is a thoroughly unpleasant here. The wind is howling, although I think it's better that the wind howls. Then at least it's going to blow the rain away from us. Here we go, here comes number three. A coalition of five male cheetah. For our new viewers, this is very unusual. Yes, male cheetah do form coalitions. They do, they are um, social cats, although the females are solitary, unless they have cubs. But to see a group of them of five strong is very, very unusual. And one thing that I've been thinking about, because these boys have really established themselves in this area, one thing I've been thinking about is very soon they are going to come across a female. And I'm just wondering, I would, I would really love to be in their vicinity when they do, because I really want to see how that situation plays out. I don't think these boys have fully figured out their dynamics yet. And nothing breaks up a brotherhood faster than the attentions of a woman. And we've got to, got to hope that we're around when that happens. Oh, Christine, welcome, sending through the first cheetah-themed question of the afternoon. Does that cheetah have a slightly bloody face, or am I imagining it? I think they've eaten today. 
They do seem, not all of them are full, but they do seem to have managed to catch themselves something. So apparently this morning they were quite hungry. And Christine, the king cheetah is a type of, basically it's a, it's a genetic aberration. It's a recessive gene and it's a, it's a normal cheetah, but it's, it's a sort of a, a type of gene that passes on very, very dark coloring. So the, the spots almost become stripes. They're slightly larger. This cheetah is walking right at us. This is so wonderful. Hello, you. You gorgeous creature. And king cheetah are very unusual because it is a recessive gene. It's not a common gene. If you have a recessive gene, obviously you need two parents to carry it. So it's not something that you see much of in the wild. A lot of centers breed king cheetahs as a way of keeping that gene within the population, which is, you know, the, the, there's debate about whether or not that's actually necessary. Hello, my boy. This is so cool. Walking right up to us. Ah, and flop. <laughs> That's really special. He's chosen to walk right past us. You can see he's flopped down on top of the tire marks near the road. And here come the rest of them. Oh, Marion, welcome to the Sunset Safari. You want to know what age cheetah cubs will leave their mothers? You're looking at around about between, depending on the whether they are male or female, you're looking at around about two years old. They take quite a while to reach sexual maturity, much like leopards, actually. Um, these five boys will be over two and a half years old. I actually think they're closer to three or four years old. I'm not sure of their exact history. But remember, Malaika is in this area. She's got two young boys who are about a year and a half, if I remember correctly. Or just, a, just under a year and a half, which is going to be interesting. No. Um, so that sort of brings us to our next question. Jeff, no, I don't think so. I, I, I could easily stand corrected, but I don't think so. I don't think these five have been dominant in this area for long enough for them to be the fathers of Malaika's boys. I don't think they're old enough either. I think they've only just started to really come into their own. And I don't think that happened. Hey, boys. I don't think that happened over a year ago. This is so awesome right next to us. When they walk next to you at this sort of level, you realize just how small they are. Here comes D'Artagnan at the back with his collar. Just to let you know, that is a collar put there by researchers, obviously, to help to keep track of their movements. The most important way that that research is used is in human wildlife conflict. Ah, oh, beautiful. Hello, gents. Obviously, you will see that there are other vehicles in the sighting. As you know, of course, there are tourists here. Look at those feet. You can see the non-retractable claws. Tian, interestingly enough, I read a very fascinating article on that exact subject not too long ago. They're walking straight towards a herd of wildebeest. I mean, it is, it is the middle of the day, but you never know. The way that these guys hunt, they take advantage of the wildebeest panic. I'm just going to wait for the fifth one to get a little bit further, and then we're going to do the safari shuffle and duck around some vehicles. I read a very interesting article about that. So the question is about whether or not cheetah will stay away from lions, or stay far away from lions' territories. And the answer is they actually can't. There's, there's not enough space for cheetah to have exclusive territories and lions to have exclusive territories. Cheetah have to have territories within territories of lions. It's just the way that they have to do it. And so there is actually a, a lot of research done into the way that cheetahs move within a lion's territory. And the conclusion is that they don't actively avoid. They res or they don't respond in a... Um, What's when you try and anticipate a problem and avoid it? Anticipate 
Oh, for goodness sake. They, they respond in a reactionary manner rather than trying to predict where the lions are going to be and avoiding the areas that, that the lions like. They run away when they see the lions or they move when they hear the lions roaring close to them, but they don't actively avoid them. Gonna duck right up ahead. Just to let you know that this afternoon, Brent is having problems with his vehicle. He has been trying to sort it out, but um, he's having problems with the broadcast equipment on, this, on his car. So he might not be joining us this afternoon. I don't know how that's going to play out. Quick look. As I said, you will notice there are other vehicles with us as well. But Fergus doing an amazing job here. There's D'Artagnan. Ava Nash, that's a really lovely idea. I have to say, I really like that as an idea. Um, so Ava Nash is wondering if Cheetah will race each other to show dominance and no, they won't. Um, they will fight in order to establish dominance and they can fight quite seriously when a female is involved. It is odd for me, having spent so much time with lions recently, it is peculiar to me to hear the sounds that they make while they fight because they sort of squeak at each other. But no, they fight. If they want to show dominance, they fight. I've never seen cheetah mock mounting, which is another way of sort of quite gently playing uh, or showing that they are dominant. But I can imagine that they do do it. Scent marking, there's so much that's happening in their way, in their language, and the way that they're speaking to each other visually and vocally as well, but mostly visual communication. One of them is definitely larger than the other, than the others. One of them definitely had a meal. The rest of them are hungry. It's the one thing that we are so very fortunate to be able to experience out here. Down again. James, as we know with these boys, two of them are slightly, I think, slightly older than the others. But yes, I think all four, all five of them are at an age where they are sexually mature and could mate. As to how it would play out, it's quite fascinating to see one that's so full compared to the rest. I wonder if he killed alone or if he was just the first to arrive and the first to have a chance to feed. They're quite peaceful about the way that they go about feeding. So yes, they're all at an age where they could mate and it's going to be very, very interesting and I hope that they don't split because of it. I hope that the conflict doesn't cause a separation in the coalition. Francis in Israel, I have absolutely no idea but I'll try and find out for you because somebody here will know. Um, obviously these cheetah have probably had company throughout the day from various safari vehicles, so I think somebody will know. I, at first, because Brent told me when he saw them that they were thin, um, and at first I actually was quite surprised because then I saw that one was fat. It could be a Tommy, it could be something that they lost to a hyenas, I'm not entirely sure. Well, there you go. See, James, we haven't put you to shame at all. James has found another spotted creature. It's more, more patchy than spotty, I think. Uh, but I'm most jealous of those cheetah musketeers. Excuse me one second. <coughs> it's very, very dusty out here. <laughs> well, we have a giraffe, and uh, we have another giraffe, and in fact, three or four of them feeding in amongst the bushes here on the southern side of this drainage line. And I wish I could tell you what they were eating. 
but I'm afraid I cannot. Let's just have a look, see, maybe I, maybe I can get close. I've certainly seen them eating this bush before. Looks like a flugia, but isn't. I wonder if it isn't some kind of a shot here or scotia. I don't know if you get scotias here. I'll have a look-see, perhaps. But definitely much less thorny than the fair on offer right now at Juma, where, of course, the knob thorns are all blooming, and that is a favourite spring food of the southern giraffe, as opposed to the Maasai giraffe, which we're looking at now. Tian, you're wondering what season it is in the Mara. Tian, we're just south of the equator, so the season is pretty much the same as it is in South Africa. It's much hotter than it was a month ago. We're going towards, I suppose, what they'd call summer here. I think you'll find it gets pretty hot, but it doesn't get freezing here. And so the variation in the seasons will be much less than it is at a place like Juma. And also, of course, we're very high up here, uh, roughly... 1,600 meters or so where we're sitting now. Maybe a little bit lower than that. But that's a mile higher for those of you working in the imperial system. So we're as high as Denver, Colorado over here. And then up at camp we're another 300 meters or 1,000 feet taller than that, which is very high up indeed. Okay, that was our giraffe sighting. Let's move along. I didn't even tell you my plan for the afternoon. My plan for the afternoon, see I'm telling you now, is to go along the river road towards where Scott had two young male lions earlier today. I'm hoping that they are going to get hungry and go on the move and perhaps try and hunt something. If they don't, we're going to come back around towards the escarpment, see if I can find well, I'm pretty much sure that they are my nemesis pride, really, the sausages. I keep trying to find them and failing, and we might just pick up as well that uh, female cheetah and her two very young cubs. Since Brent found them, we haven't managed to see them again. All right, the are probably just behind the wildebeest, and so Jamie wants to tell you about them. They are getting closer to the wildebeest. They're about to use a croton thicket to hide them away. Oh, oh, where are we trotting to? Hold on. Hold on, everyone. Okay, he's just going across the road. And we just wait for this last guy to come wandering through in front. And then we'll move across. The last cheetah boy, not nearly as full as the other one. Mm, not doing too badly, though. So at least we know they have had one meal. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go loop around towards where the wildebeest are. We're gonna give these boys plenty of space so that they've got plenty of space to maneuver. Duck out of everybody's way. individual cheetah is to look at their spot patterns. So typically the way that researchers do it is to look at a profile, a left profile and a right profile of the whole cheetah. And the way that I find works best for me in terms of becoming familiar, that's quite nice, becoming familiar with the different cheetah that we see is to look for really obvious spots. So to look at spots that form a face or a shape or something like that. So once we get, a po get to the point where we can actually closely observe these cheetah boys, we, it, once they're flat, we can start looking for some of their characteristic markers. Obviously D'Artagnan's got a collar and that makes life much easier, but that's what we will be doing. Okay, these boys are going to go into this thicket. It's clever. They're going to walk towards this thicket and they're going to go and ambush the wildebeest on the other side. And what we're going to do, instead of staying on their tail, is we're going to go around to where the wildebeest are going around the other side of the croton thicket. And we're going to settle ourselves there. Marching off. Okay. Not all of them 
not full, actually. Uh, but yes, they will hunt again if they have eaten. It depends on the time of day, and it depends on the situation. But if they are not full, which most of them are not, then it will that will determine whether or not they decide to hunt again. And I think the fact that three of them are not nearly as full as the other two suggests that they might. They might not do it immediately, which is why I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to duck them just yet. Mm. Let's just let me just wait one second and just see. I mean they move, then they stop, then they move, then they stop, then they move, then they stop. Yeah, let's go around. Let's go around. And also, of course, during the migration, all of the rules go out of the window. And all predators will hunt if the opportunity presents itself, whether they're hungry or full. It's th their level of determination is determined by how hungry they are. Cheetah can run. Cheetah can run at well over 100 kilometers an hour, which is what is that in miles? I'm terrible with mile conversions. 60, 60 odd miles an hour. Mm hmm. I seem to be angling back in this direction. I'm going to cut through. I'm going to cut through the center of this thicket. Obviously, five cheetah boys, it's a very popular, popular sighting, and I always try to skim the edges and stay quite far away if possible. And the wildebeest have stopped on the other side of this croton thicket. I'm going to do the same, and we'll just wait. We'll wait patiently for them. While we wait for them to pop out, which they are going to do, let's have a peruse of what options are on this side for them. And we've got the wildebeest, we've got the Thompson's gazelle. Let's have a look and see. There, the wildebeest. Some Tommies there as well. The wildebeest saw them earlier, so they're on alert. And there's very, very little cover for these boys, but there's five of them, which is something that they have taken full advantage of in the way that they hunt, and the way that they move through an area. They cause panic, they don't, they very seldom reach their top speeds. Remember that when a cheetah is running at top speed, I haven't actually really fully finished that uh, that question. When a cheetah is running at top speed, there is a limit to how far they can run. And that is simply because they're built for those bursts of energy and it is hugely, hugely demanding on their bodies and their muscles. Their muscle structure uh, is completely in the way that they they sort of deal with the buildup of lactic acid and all of that is completely different to a human being. That's why human beings can run long distance marathons after training, whereas cheetah have to sprint and then stop. They cannot continue for a long period of time. But these boys, they're clever in the way that they hunt. They've also got the advantage of numbers. They cause panic and then they split up and because the wildebeest are running in every direction and because they've split up one of them is bound to get close enough to be able to catch something whether or not they manage is a different story but that's what they're going to be after that's the way that they're going to be the situation is going to be playing out Melissa, I think life would be very tough for a cheetah that has lost a part of its tail because then it go brings us back to the conversation we were having about their top speeds and the way that they run. 
the, the tail actually acts as a balancing counterweight. So when they run and when they change direction and when they duck and dive, that tail is actually there stretched out or contracting whatever it has to do in order to balance them and to help them not tip over at the speeds that they're going at. So if a cheetah were to lose part of its tail, I actually think it would be quite it would be quite disadvantaged. It would probably still be able to catch food. It would just have to hope that the food ran in a straight line and didn't duck off to the left or the right too rapidly. It'd probably struggle with that. But it's I think it would still be able to function. It's not as though the tail is an absolute essential. Losing a leg, it probably wouldn't make it. But losing a tail, I think it could survive. I think that these cheetahs have probably gone to lie down briefly. Let's wait and see though. Sorry Ferg, what was that? They did move. Up this way. Everybody seems to be sitting down that side as well though. They could easily have just walked and then sat down for a rest. I think we're going to be doing that a lot this afternoon. Let's just go investigate around. As I search for where my spotty cheetah have disappeared into the croton thickets, James is having a spotty day indeed with some hyena. There we have got some hy well, a hyena, a spotted hyena, with its dinner, its Sunday dinner. I'm not convinced that its taste is anything like the Sunday roast lamb that my father probably produced today. I think it's an impala. How it died I don't know because I suspect this female hyena did not catch it herself. I say female hyena because if you look carefully, there we are. You can see uh, although males and females share genitalia, they do not share uh, teats for babies. Now I wonder if I talk very quietly, if a little baby won't come out of this culvert and thereby delight us with its smallness and cuteness. I'm obviously talking rubbish because I don't think there's any real need to whisper, but you know, sometimes you get into the rhythm of things and you can't stop. It looks to me like she's got cubs. In other words, I think she's lactating. You might also be able to hear the metallic scratching sound of Mayer's parrots flying overhead. You might also be able to hear the thudding as I hit my head trying to get rid of the flies. It's very irritating. She's looking down towards the little culvert here and I wonder, salivating as she is, whether she doesn't have a little one there that has been frightened back into the culvert by our arrival. Strawhead, what an astounding name. Yes, Strawhead, you say such menacing teeth. Well, they are, but you know, they're no more menacing, in fact, I think less so than the, the teeth of a lion, for example, those massive canines, which make me shudder every time I look at them. And it's not so much the teeth. The teeth in a, on a hyena are blunter than they would be on a lion, and that's of course because they are used to crush bones. So they're thicker and blunter, slightly more robust. And it's the jaws that are the really terrifying thing on an animal like this hyena. Don't seem to be particularly enamored by the meal she has there. That salivation is really very distasteful. I'm starting to feel quite nauseous. I'm just going to give her a few minutes to see if a cub doesn't emerge. That is the definition, quintessential, of eating something with long teeth, I feel. Now look, what you can see from those teeth is, of course, if she turns her head again, oh, come on, you can see how robust those molars are, the carnassials, which are the back teeth. 
much more robust and much less sharp than you'd find on a lion or a leopard. Now she is lactating heavily. She has definitely got a cub somewhere around the place. Yeah, now Francis from Israel, an interesting question. You say, any chances she could be taking this carcass back to the den? I'm going to say no, and I'll tell you why I don't think so. Uh, for two reasons. Firstly, if she was taking it back to the den, she'd be taking it back to the den. This is not a big carcass. She's an extremely powerful animal. It wouldn't be much trouble for her to just pick it up and walk with it. So I don't think that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that I think that these culverts are extensively used, especially by lower-ranking females. And it is entirely possible that, oh, uh, you know what it is? It's a baby topi. It's a very newborn topi. The chances are that if this is a low-ranking female, she's used this culvert as a little birthing site for her, for her cubs. And what we know about hyenas and about low-ranking hyenas especially, Francis, is that they don't tend to take food back to the den. They rather eat and then go back to the den and suckle their youngsters because if they go back to a den site where there are other hyenas especially as low-ranking females chances are they will have their food stolen by higher-ranking members whereas higher-ranking females who will not have their food stolen do sometimes take food back to the dens okay I'm afraid we're going to have to move we have managed to park somebody in here so we're going to carry on down the road I'm sorry, my dear. Right. Oh, that's quite a nice shot, actually. Hello. You can see this hapless little topi. Shame. You can see she picks it up with absolutely no trouble at all. I feel a bit bad now. We're the reason she's moving. Anyway, she was not in a very clever position. Okay, let's go back to Jamie. She's managed to refind her spotted chitars. Well, it wasn't too hard to refind them. I just had to go back around the croton thicket, and, and there they are. All five of them spread eagled, and mm, I would actually say pretty fat and happy. I don't know what it was that they fed on, but they've enjoyed a meal. Now, probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave these boys for now. I think that the chase, I think it was a recent kill, and I think that the chase would have exhausted them. So I don't think that they're going to move very far from the spot. And this is peak viewing hours, so there's lots and lots of people around here. So I'm going to make space for, for the people. Go and in, adventure around a little bit, go find some elephants or something like that. Or who knows, maybe a leopard. Because as you can see, there's lots of cars moving through the sighting. And we'll come back when we have the Mara to ourselves. Nix, it's fascinating, isn't it, the way that cheetahs sleep? It's so different to the way that we're accustomed to seeing leopards and lions. Oh, cool, by the way, look at the bottom of the foot. It's a really nice way to get an idea of the bottom of the pad and the way that their track looks and the elongated three lobes. Very, very different. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, cheetah. How oh, cool is that? Sorry, Nix, give me one sec just struck me that we had such a fantastic view of it. Um, so the way that the, the cheetah is structured and the fact that they're not the apex predator out here means that they are they're prone to sleeping. Look they do sleep with their heads flat as you can see but they are prone to sleeping with their heads up like this and when they sleep with their heads up like this it usually means at some point you're going to see movement from them but when they actually properly bed down for the night then they drop their heads right down in the way that D'Artagnan's doing. But the, the way that they're structured and the weight of their head obviously allows their bodies and the, the strength in their neck allows their bodies to sit quite comfortably like that. I imagine it would give us terrible neck ache if we were to do it. And I don't think lion, you don't really see lions or leopards doing that. Lori, yes. It is one of the reasons that cheetah are structured in the way that they are. So Lori is wondering about their small heads. And yes, that plays a role into their aerodynamics. It also helps to reduce the weight that they have to carry. Obviously, the heavier they are, the harder it would be and the more muscle they'd need to run. And then, you know, it's, it's counterproductive. So that is 
they, they're not adapted to crunching bone. It's one of the ways that they differ from things like those hyenas that you saw with James. They're not adapted to break into carcasses and, and crunch through heavy bone. They don't need that by force pressure. The only thing they need to be able to do is to be able to suffocate their prey, and they do that by the stranglehold. But otherwise they don't need the excessively powerful jaw of something like a hyena or even a lion. And that means they don't need the same muscle attachment points and they're structured in a way that is completely different. And remember that although they are part of the same family, if, although they are part of the Felid family, Felidae family, they are not closely related to lions or leopards. They're a very, very different cat. Something completely unique. Semi, semi-retractable claws, basically almost non-retractable claws. Very different leg structure. The ability to purr, the inability to roar, which is something we were talking about with lions. We were chatting about whether or not lions can purr, and they can't. Not in the true, not by the true definition of purring. But cheetah can. Cheetah can produce that vibration that makes a purr when they're contented. Only other big cat that can purr in the way they can is a snow leopard, apparently. Granny, it's the way that they've evolved to, the, the, the structure and the way that they've evolved. So Granny's question is why is it that leopards don't form coalitions in the same way cheetah do? One thing that you'll notice with leopards is that, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure what came first, the chicken or the egg, so to speak, but if you look at leopards, the sexual dimorphism, the difference in size, oh, the difference in size between the males and the females is very, very clear. The males are almost double the size of the females, whereas it's not as distinctive in cheetah. Yes, the males are bigger, but not nearly as as big. And there's obviously a way that nature during the, you know, during the evolution of the cheetah versus the leopard, obviously there were certain advantages that worked well for leopards in, in terms of being solitary. And cheetah are interesting because, of course, it's only the males that form coalitions for territories. Obviously, it was worth the trade-off of not potentially having the opportunity to mate, whereas for leopards it wasn't. But it's a good question, because I don't know exactly why, but it's interesting to note just the difference in size. Melissa, yes. Male cheetah in particular do get territorial. They mark their territories, that's what we so frequently see them doing when they spray urine up against the tree. So yes, they do get territorial. The females are, although it is possible um, for females to encounter to each other and to fight, the females are less territorial than the males. They're almost nomadic because they don't really stay in one place. They often move and cover great distances in their lifetimes. But the males do stay in one place. They have regular territorial patrols that they go on and boundaries that they mark. And if they were to encounter other males, there would be a good chance there would be a fight. He's got a little bit of a gummy eye. Nothing too serious, though. Flies clustering about. I think these cheetah killed recently. Oh, whatever effect the weather might be having on the situation, one has to say that the, the the skies are truly dramatic and really quite stunning, and James has got a view that he would love to share. Well, yes, it's not a view of my mug. Uh, we basically had to go back to my mug because I managed to, well, lock the steering and we had a problem. But now you may look at the view of the rain pounding the southern reaches of the Masai Mara. And I'm hoping fervently that I will not get caught in that rain. Not so much because I'm afraid of getting wet, much more so because I'm afraid of being stuck in a small tent with Jandre. It is a fate that I have nightmares about every evening. 
Then there are also two rather magnificent male impala wandering away from the scene. We've just been passed by a vehicle, which means when you see me next I will be filthy dirty from the dust. But there certainly is thunder and there certainly is a bit of rain starting to fall now. So I'm hoping we're going to escape some of it, but I'm not sure. We're not too far from where Scott saw the lions this morning, but I can see a lot of topi in the area, which means even either those topi are about to be devoured, or the lions have moved on. <laughs> you might be able to hear the soft pitter-patter of moisture falling now on the roof. Next you say, where do we sleep when we stay, all, stay out all night and it happens to rain? Well, you sleep in the tent, basically. So this car turns into a canvas tent, pretty much. And then you just sleep around here. And if you happen to be my size, then it's actually not too bad. We use these mattresses and then put them on the vehicle. And if you're my size, well, then you're okay. If you're John Dree's size, then you're in for an uncomfortable time of it. Scott has very cleverly designed this particular vehicle so that you can sleep on the roof, which uh, is going to be something that I'm looking forward to experiencing. I've managed to do that yet. I've only slept on the car. But as I say, if you're five feet and eight inches tall, it's not too uncomfortable. But if you're six feet and four inches, like poor old John Dree, then it's not so easy. OK, we're going to go back to Jamie, the other side of the river with the cheetah. I don't know if they're hunting. Apparently, there's a bit of a Top Gear show on the way. Well, we did have a bit of a Top Gear show, and I've, uh, Fergus and I were using the camera to try and work out exactly what it was that had attracted the attention. So let me show you what, what James was referring to when he said Top Gear show. Um, something happened over there. And I think that Fergus is, might have hit upon what happened, in that something might have stolen the kill of those cheetah. But something has obviously taken all of the vehicles that were with us and taken them over there. And I, for one, am quite happy with that. I, I can't go down there. We won't have any signal, so we can't go and investigate what it is. There's some vultures that were hanging around. Anyway, that's what we meant by the Top Gear show. Bye-bye. We'll stay with the cheetah. Now we've got them all, almost all to ourselves, which means that we can just do a little shift around. I'm not going to go too close. There we go. Hello, boys. Oh, somebody rolled into somebody else. Oh, it's okay. What's what's wrong with them? Yeah, I think you're right. I think they have been chased. A little bit nervy. They could be. I can't quite work out exactly where I am compared to where I was this morning, but I think I'm looking for the mast. I think we're quite close to where I had those young male lions, and I think it's a possibility that those young males came in and stole from these cheetah. <laughs> Aiden, who is six years old. Now, Aiden, you want to know if I ever get lost. Aiden, I get lost all the time, regularly, especially in the dark and especially when it's cloudy, so I can't tell, I can't look at the stars to tell me which direction I'm driving in. And there's no phone signal out here, and I haven't got around to sorting out a map system, so, so yes, I get lost regularly. Not lost, lost, though. It's not like I don't know where I am. I, I have a rough idea. I know where the main cities are. I know I've got a couple of landmarks that I can use to help to find my way. Lights help as well. So no, we're never completely lost, but yes, sometimes I'm lost. Sometimes it's like driving around on Mars. It really is. At night, you could be anywhere. You, you drive around following these animals, especially in the middle of the night, and it was, it was especially bad when we first started here, because obviously this was unfamiliar territory. My goodness, do you think we could... We didn't, we didn't really know. Brent's, Brent's got a fantastic sense of direction. He always seems to know exactly where he's going. I don't know. I, my direct sense of direction isn't bad, but I do mix up one valley to the next, especially if it's got not much to recommend it. 
you know, if it's pretty average looking. By my standards, which I admit are pretty high. Ginger, no, I'm never afraid that the cheetah will jump in the vehicle, especially not cheetah, and that's simply because that would be very, very unusual behavior. In, you mean, obviously, in terms of attacking me. Cheetah, in particular, are probably the least aggressive and least dangerous of the big cats. In fact, they're definitely the least dangerous of the big cats out here. They're not a threat to human beings, and they never have been. And the, the number of recorded cases of cheetah deaths, cheetah human deaths, are so, so small. And usually that involves children. Children are a different matter, but adults, the cheetah does not see as potential prey, even at night. What does worry me is them jumping onto the car to use me as a termite mound. And fortunately that behavior has been stopped over recent years, but it became the done thing to put yourself near the cheetah's path so that they would come up and use you as either a, a barrier between them and the prey so that they could hide away or so that they could use you as a vantage point because cheetah habituate people very very quickly and they would jump on the bonnet that's or the hood i believe it's known as that's very dangerous and it's it's highly highly un it's behavior that should not be encouraged because first of all it's interfering with the natural behavior of the animal which yes of course happens with many safari vehicles wandering about but shouldn't be done to excess absolutely secondly it runs the risk of the cheetah losing its fear completely of people responding to movement if there's a child or something in the next vehicle that comes along responding to movement and having to be destroyed because it's learned to that that human beings are a fun thing to jump into the vehicle and attack. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. It also run, it runs the risk of spreading disease. So it really is a practice that shouldn't be encouraged. So while I'm not frightened of it, I am aware of the risk. And so far, none of the cheetahs have tried to jump into the car with us or onto the car with us. Fergie, you haven't had any? No, I don't think any of us have. That behavior is being phased out. Um, speaking on, on moving on to more amusing topics, but to do with the proximity of the animals, I didn't do it, yes. Some of the animals have scent marked our vehicles before. It has happened in the past, um, particularly with lions. If I remember correctly, James came very, very close to being scent marked once by the Birmingham boys. We were all sitting watching it in, in final control for some reason. Um, it's usually just ha so happens that you happen to park yourself next to the tree or the bush that they want to scent mark on. And they spray on it and then you you find yourself caught in the crossfire. But never, I've never had it on it. I had a lion rub its cheek up against the side of my car once. <laughs> Leopards would be okay because at least you'd smell like popcorn. Cheetah, lions, meh, not so much. Hyena, definitely not. Rhonda, apparently, I've been told Malika is very, very close to, or was yesterday, very close to where we are with these boys. So there are female cheetah around, of course, Musiara came across to the triangle. Um, Kikenya is down south where unfortunately we don't get signal. Kikenya's daughters also, although we suspect one of them is the mother of those young cubs. Um, Armani, we've got Armani's daughters, we just haven't been up that side. It was my plan to go there tomorrow morning to look for Armani's daughters. Pass through double crossing, cross crossing and towards the marsh. So that's one of the things that I have on my to-do list. I haven't seen many female cheetah, but they are around. Remember what we talked about in terms of the, the territories of the animals and the territories of the cheetah. The fact that, in essence, there are the males are easier to find than the females because the females cover an enormous distance and they don't patrol regular routes. So whilst they're here, they're just somewhat harder to find. Brent actually found one yesterday. Raised by cats, good point, 
Very, very good point. Um, yes, to a degree, they're less aggressive than the other big cats. So the question is really based around the, the lack of scarring on these cheetah. Oh, we're we getting hot now. I think we might be fat bellied and warm. Uh, the lack of scarring on cheetah compared to something like a lion or a leopard. Yes, they don't fight as often amongst themselves. And usually a cheetah coalition, once it's established itself, has one dominant male. Whereas the male competition between the, the lions and the claws at their size means that their f aggressive fights often result in quite serious looking injuries. Speaking of male lions, of course, let us go across to the Mara Triangle to James. Yes, I'm a male lion. Rawr. The two male lions that Scott had this morning that were doing absolutely nothing have had a very busy day of it. And they have killed for themselves, this is the first time I've seen this here, a fully grown eelunt. It looks like an eelunt bull to me. It is a massive, massive animal and they will be feeding on this thing for days until, well, unless some hyenas manage to discourage them. But it's highly unlikely that the hyenas will manage to do that. I mean, that really is quite an enormous prey. Uh, in fact, they are slightly younger than I thought they were. I'd put them at about four years old. John Drew was asking me if one of them has a collar. I don't think he does. No, I think they're both collarless. No, he don't. one of them does have a collar. One behind there. So they are two males that we've seen in this area quite regularly. I had thought for a while that they perhaps had moved on with the migration herds because we know these nomads do follow the migration herds for a certain amount of sp for a little uh, certain amount of distance I suppose I should say Now all of you seem to be very excited and impressed that the lions managed to take down such an enormous prey item. I think it is really impressive. You know, I don't know how, I have so little experience of Ila that I don't know how agile and good at defending themselves they are. You know, a big buffalo bull is, although smaller than an Ireland is a phenomenal enemy to a lion and I mean it can do some serious damage to a lion but I'm not sure if the same goes for something like an eland. I mean I imagine they must have some defensive mechanism but for two lions to have taken out a 750 kilogram animal I mean that is quite something and they did not do this a long time ago I would say well, I would say it about two hours ago, probably. But the time of death at around about three o'clock this afternoon. And now the lion in front is just feeding the intestines through the, through the teeth. Kathy, you want to know how long the eland is from tip to tail? Well, I mean, I can guess and tell you I think it's probably about two and a half meters long. And then I can take a book out and give you an actual, uh, an actual estimate of his length. I think this book's got lengths in them. And you wanted to know in feet, Kathy. Well, Kathy, two and a half meters in feet is about eight feet about eight feet. Um, an eland size, height estimated, T, I don't know what that means, shoulder height, I don't know what HB means, I think that's length, oh, head, head to backside, yeah. Yeah, exactly, two and a half for, for a male, up to 3.2 meters, which Kathy, 3.2 meters times uh, you can multiply that by 3.25 if you like and you'll get there so somewhere around about nine um, call it 11 feet 10 feet 10 or 11 feet plus minus so 
so it is a big animal. Uh, mass, as I was saying, female up to 500 kilograms, male up to 900 kilograms. Now, 900 kilograms is 100 kilograms shy of a ton, and 900 kilograms in pounds, for those of you still operating in Imperial, is... that's much easier to work out. It's about 3,000... no, 2,000 pounds. That's multiplied by 2.2. Yes, Andrea, they do. You say, do lions always eat the heart of their prey? Yes, it's what makes them brave. And that's why they eat the heart of the prey. If they didn't eat the heart of their prey, Andrea, they wouldn't be as brave as they are. That's why the expression brave, brave as a lion has uh, come into the uh, English lexicon. I'm, of course, talking garbage. Andrea, they will quite often eat the, eat the heart. And the reason they eat the heart is, of course, because it's very nutritious and it's easy to get to. So once they've opened up the belly and they've pulled out the slightly less tasty uh, intestines, well, then they will often eat the liver, the kidneys, the lungs and the heart. You know, I'm not sure if they actually select for it. Um, I suspect they probably do because it's soft and easy to get out, it's a muscle, so it's very nutritious. Now you might be able to hear what sounds like um, a crowd of football hooligans just behind us. It isn't in fact a crowd of football hooligans, it is just a very excited family on holiday. So <laughs> they are chatting very animatedly to each other. them are quite young as well, with that piercing voice of the youngster. Reminds me of my nephews, and indeed of Steph's son. What a meal they have, these guys. They will be so happy with their efforts on a Sunday. Well, Joe, yes, they are. Almost inevitably, a lion that is four years old will be, as you suggest, trespassing on another lion's territory. This is the territory of a pride called the Mogoro pride, which is most likely uh, just very similar, if not the same pride, very closely allied to the Paradise pride and likely also the Serena North pride, but uh, basically the Mogoro pride. And so to find them here wouldn't be that unusual if they'd been born into that pride. But they're also, at four years old, they're in the territory, of course, of the four musketeer brothers. Uh, not the cheetah, of course, the lion musketeers. Whenever there's a group of males, everyone calls them musketeers for some reason. I just had to smile at you while my strap was in. And so they're in... It's terrible when you find yourself so amusing. Um, they're in the territory of the Four Musketeers, which of course includes the famous Scarface, who we met many times during our TV, or once or twice during our TV show, but certainly over the three months that we were here. No, Jared's buddy, you say, are they collared because they're nomads? No, they're collared because they, I mean, I don't know when they were collared. I'm not sure exactly what research project has been uh, designed for that collar. But it's not necessarily because they're nomads. They could easily be uh, on, on... It's because, I'm sure it's because they're young males. And they probably are trying to find out, you know, their movements. So, well, yeah, I guess you probably could say because they're nomads, because they are young males, they are inevitably nomadic, although these chaps have been in this area for some time. They are ne inevitably, however, nomadic. And so maybe that collar is doing that kind of research. I'm not sure whose collar it is or who's getting pings from it or who's doing the research on those particular lions. There are many, many research groups and endless amounts of data being produced by researchers in the Masai Mara. 
Now, Roshni, you ask a very good question about that column, whether or not it has a battery in it that needs to be replaced. And the answer is yes, it does have a battery in it, and it does need to be replaced. But I'm going to desperately now try and find this wonderful message I got from somebody whose name I have to my eternal discredit have forgotten but they sent me a wonderful wonderful message about who makes these collars and it was because of I made a, a flippant comment about the fact that this lion has a collar on it that looks so big and I said well why on earth surely by now they should be able to make um, collars that aren't so big and ugly and I'm Alice if you don't mind I'm gonna finish my conversation is that okay and then we can go to unless something is going on there all right so basically there are, there's a bunch of people in South Africa who make these collars and they make just about all of them they've put them on fish uh, they've put them on as I said the other day and I know this is going to be difficult to uh, be uh, difficult to believe but they've actually put them also on bees and they design these collars especially for research of various animals. And I will try and find the message while I'm waiting for you while we then go across to Jamie. But basically, they do have a battery. And the reason they're so big is that that battery doesn't last forever. And it doesn't even operate all the time. It, it sends a ping out every sort of, you know, it's a timed ping. So, say, 6 o'clock in the morning every day, it'll send a ping out. And that'll give a position as to where the animal is. But because of uh, its it has to last so long uh, it has limited kind of um, it has limited uh, use from a time perspective whoops daisies and also that's why it's so big okay while I try and find my message let's head across back to Jamie for her cheetah which I think are doing much the same as these lions Now this morning we had a, a long conversation about how we became guides and I went into my my initial experiences in a on a reserve called Swalu, which is in the Green Kalahari. It's a very beautiful place. And um just talking about collars with James, one of the things that I got to assist with was the implantation of a transmitter in the abdomen of a cheetah rather than trying to put a collar around its neck as a way of trying to be well essentially to to try and have less impact on the animal's life so although it had an operation the transmitter had very long lasting batteries that then were uh, capable of transmitting for an entire three years i think it's something that's been largely put by the wayside in favor of collars. It was something that the vets were testing as a way of tracking the animals without having an impact on them but it was, I think it was decided to be too invasive, but I did actually get to participate in that. And it was an amazing experience because first of all, we had to get the cheetah and then it was anesthetized and I had an, an opportunity to actually watch the operation. Can't do it with females. I couldn't do it with any female cheetah or actually any female animals because of the risk of the transmitter being you know, close to the uterus and the ovaries. Whereas with the males, obviously, slightly different layout of everything, they were they had space in their abdomen to fit it. I don't know whatever became of that situation, but I don't think it's a it's not a popular method of a tracking down cheetah. But it is one of the alternatives to putting a collar on them. The speed that that cheetah came out of its anaesthetic and moved away from us was quite astounding. It's also one of the few places where a person has actually been attacked by a cheetah while in a vehicle. Funnily enough, not in any way connected. This was a long time before that the, the vets um, the vets tried out that transmitting technique. There was a cheetah that walked up to the door, completely unexpected, as relaxed as these animals are, and grabbed the guide's arm. Totally, totally unexpected. The, the vehicles don't have doors there. The cheetah were perfectly habituated. Nobody ever expected it. And then to this day, don't quite understand why. So it just goes to show you never get blasé about wild animals because they can do unexpected things. Speaking of unexpected things and speaking of doing unexpected things, I'm going to leave it in your hands. How's about that? 
I don't think these cheetah are going to move from where they are until it gets dark. I am, however, more than happy to sit and we can chat about them and look at them. They're beautiful to look at. So I'm really not too fussed. Would you prefer to stay with these five cheetah boys or would you prefer to move on and come back? I'm really, either way, I'm happy. You can send through your vote on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Stay with them for the duration of the Sunset Safari or leave and come back. I don't mind. Oh, there you go. Isn't that lovely? They are our pot of gold, Ferg. Five pots of gold with black spots. Spots of gold. Spots of gold. Here we go. Who needs real gold when you've got cheetah? It's looking really lovely. Here's a double, it's very difficult to actually see, but I, from my perspective, I can see two rainbows. One is obviously much, much fainter than the other. Beautiful whole spectrum of light. We're back to our pot of gold, or pots of gold. Pollen, you say you would stay with cheetahs for your entire life. Fair enough. Apparently most of you are saying let's stay. I'm more than happy to stay here. Obviously it's just James and myself out this afternoon. Brent has had to begin his long journey back towards the camp so that they can get the problem sorted out. So I'm more than happy to go with that vote. I really am. I'm not going to complain about a moment spent with cheetah. I think we're thoroughly spoilt to have access to these five males. We really are. Ah, now some people are wanting to go and see the Black Rock Pride. I don't have a map in the car with me, but let me try and try and give you a sense of scale. So now, do it. Well, this will sort of this will sort of help us. Okay, to try and give you a sense of scale on a map. Can, do you think you'll be able to see this, Ferg? Oh, yeah. um, I know my my screen is terribly dusty and dirty. The screen protector seems to pick up additional. Can you see it or is it too bright? Kind of get it. Okay, so obviously we are the blue dot. That is Talek where we're living. That is Kika Rock and Black Rock is over there. To give you a, a sense of scale as to how long that's going to take for me to get to the Black Rock Pride, as much as I would love to, it would probably take me the next two and a half hours to get there. So we could but it would take me through bad signal areas. It would take me to through an area with no comms. James would have to do most of the sunset safari and I'd probably reappear right at the end. And we have only got two hours left. So uh, unfortunately, the Black Rock Pride, to give you a sense of scale, um, no, I'm sorry, I would love to, but it took me most of the morning to get here from where we were. I, it would take me most of the afternoon to get back. It, it, the sense of scale and the sense of distance here is hard to explain. The, the Black Rock Pride is probably about uh, 50, no, that's a bit much, 40 k's away. And the roads obviously don't always go directly there. The roads aren't fantastic through dips and valleys. No, unfortunately not. Not even if I could fly there. It would be lovely though. I'm almost as far away from them as James is. Not quite, but almost. So on an average night, you know, when we're out all night, sorry, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Mm. On an average night when we are out with the animals, it usually takes us minimum of an hour to get home. In terms of dropping our rangers off who are with us and then heading back towards camp, that's the sort of usual minimum time. It's often more than that. It does, it's one of the wondrous things about being out here in the Mara, it really is, in that we've got this vast sense of space and freedom to go where we want to go. 
but it is something that sort of adds to, I wouldn't say the stress of being out here, but it does add to the complexity and the planning of where exactly it is we're going to go. And it's why when you pick a when you pick a sort of an idea in your head, okay, I want to go and find the five Cheetah Brothers, you 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 know that you're dedicating yourself to them. Because chances are you're not going to be able to get to another cheetah sighting, for example, unless Malaika happens to turn up in the vicinity. And yes, there's lots of lions scattered, scattered about, but you've got to sort of make a plan that you can journey through the, the dips, the highs and the lows in terms of signal and comms and still get out the other side in time to not leave just one person left in the sunset or the sunrise safari. So you sort of, you get my gist. The planning involved is, is more complex than we often mention. And when we're planning out our TV shows and when we're planning out our all-nighters and where we're going to be, a lot of thought goes into exactly which way we're going to go. Especially when you can't find what you're looking for. <laughs> Oh goodness, so many options available to us. I'm going to think about what it is we're going to do and find out exactly what all of you want. We'll give you another five minutes to decide. While you think about it, head on back across to James, who's left his lines for now. We don't have anything like the same number of options as Jamie does, although I'm not sure what her options are. We're going down towards Main North Crossing, where there was a huge number of animals uh, gathering earlier, and we thought uh, that they might do a migration-style crossing earlier today. Taylor came herring out of the final control room. She said, there's going to be a crossing. I said, Taylor, calm yourself. Put a cold towel on your head. Uh, we have seen crossings before. Those animals have been there all day. She said, no. There are hundreds of millions of them now. I said, hundreds of millions? Look how astounded this buffalo is even by the um, assertion that there could be hundreds of millions of animals about to cross the river. Anyway, I'm going to go and see where those hundreds of millions are. There certainly were a lot of them. That wasn't obviously how Taylor speaks. I just can't speak like Taylor. Killed it. <laughs> it's dead now. You know, for those of you who've got hair, a fly sitting on top of it, you don't feel it. But when you have no hair here, and it comes and sits and crawls, it's very uncomfortable, very disconcerting. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you that, in case you were wondering why I was killing flies. That was a buffalo we saw earlier. I don't think I announced that fact. All right. Now, this is amazing that Jamie has managed to come up with a decision. I'm very excited to find out what it is, and I'm sure that you are too. I decided, and I assume that from Alice's side, she, um, she's comfortable that, that is, this is the majority view. I think the decision is to leave the cheetah, but not for very long. So we'll do a, a small loop. We'll find some elephants or something like that and then we'll return to them towards I would actually you know what I've just looked at the time it's quarter to six mm, mm, I've changed my mind we're staying we're staying we're going to sit it out we're going to outpatience it unless um, Alice you, you have to tell me about the the majority rule there because I did offer it up as a vote if you're comfortable that that is the democratic conclusion then I think that's what we should do. I didn't realize it had got so late so quickly. We can have a look at a superb starling, or not. Or it could, it's there, it's in that funny looking two-pronged fork over there. Um, come on, superb starling, if you look, yes, there. It's on the left-hand fork. It's there, come on, out you come. Oh, 
<laughs> Fergus just made a noise like a pirate. <laughs> Oh, forgive me, I didn't quite catch the name there, Alice. I think it was Betts, but I might be wrong. <laughs> Gates with a G. <laughs> Alice, um... Alice tried to, to help me out there, but she um, she got tongue-tied herself. Sorry. Uh, Gates, apologies for mangling your name. Totally unintentional. Cheetah cubs especially will hunt things like birds or rodents when they're on the ground. And one thing that we have seen is cheetahs chasing things like mongoose, which are quite small. And really, it's more for the fun of the chase than it is for the food. I mean, it's, it's that natural cat-like response to movement. So yes, potentially, um, less so than something like a leopard. A leopard will, will specifically stalk and try and hunt a bird on the ground. But a Franklin or a guinea fowl could fall foul, ha ha, ha ha, um, could fall foul of the cheetah if it happened to be unaware. They're not really geared for that kind of hunting though. They don't have the same sort of reflexes and speed and agility that something like a leopard has. They're built for speed, obviously, but not those rapid fire paw movements that leopards are capable of producing. But yes, it is possible. Gates with a G. Hey, Taco. Uh, Taco is five years old. Taco, thank you for watching and thank you for sending through your question. Now, Taco, you want to know if cheetah are taller than lions. They are not. A lion is quite a lot taller than a cheetah. So, Taco, if we have a look here, if Ferg will show you next to my vehicle, and unfortunately I've got the wrong earpiece, so turning around is a tricky thing, but I'm going to try and show you. So, Taco, if we look here, when a lion walks past the car, when a lion walks right past the car, big male lion, his shoulder is probably here. Can you sort of see that, Ferg? Mm -hmm. Okay, so his shoulder's sort of there, and when a cheetah walks past the car, his shoulder's probably somewhere down there. So, the cheetah are much, much shorter than a lion, and they actually, I'm going to turn around this way so that I can face you more comfortably, they actually are much smaller than lions in a lot of ways. I remember that these cheetah probably only weigh somewhere in the region of maybe 50 kilograms, maybe a little bit more, which is over 110 pounds, or around about 110 pounds. A lion, a big lion, a big male lion can weigh up to around about 180 kilograms, sometimes even more, up to 200, which is over 400 pounds. So they're much, much bigger cats. And that's why cheetah run away from lions when they see them. They run as fast as they can because they're scared of the lions. A lion is much more dangerous than a cheetah, much, much bigger. Even a lioness is taller than a male cheetah. Now a leopard, a female leopard is shorter than a cheetah, but she's just as stocky and just as heavy and probably stronger. A female leopard would probably be stronger than one of these males. A female leopard though would not pick a fight with five of them. You know, we've seen that with the hyenas as well. The hyenas tend to, when they're on their own, be exceptionally reticent to approach these cheetah boys. Starling! Starling! Well spotted, Fergus. Well spotted. The superb starling made an appearance and then flew away again almost immediately, but very well spotted. Thank you, Ferg. Nice one for some of you, I think, for your bird lists. We added a hoopoo this morning, which I have not yet seen in the Mara. Uh, I added a... Oh, that's another thing I saw today while we wait for these cheetahs to decide what they're going to do with their lives. Um... Oh gosh, hold on, got to find it quickly. There, this is what I found. This is what we found, feeding in the tree. A beautiful starling feeding in the tree above our vehicles. It's very, very pretty. 
uh, sunbird. Sorry, I've got starling in my head. Thanks, Ferg. A beautiful sunbird. It's literally called a beautiful sunbird. I mean, it's definitely not a starling. Oh, and there is a starling now. Right, enough of this. I'm getting confused as it is. Let's find out whether James has managed to keep hold of his train of thought better than I have. Well, I managed to keep to my plan, which was to come to this crossing to see what was going on, and uh, nothing is going on at all. There's some hippo there, and the great massing of animals that was here earlier has absconded. Where they've gone, I couldn't begin to tell you. I don't think they crossed, because I'm pretty sure Taylor was watching them. So I don't know where they went. Maybe the Paradise Pride chased them away. In fact, Jondry, <laughs> if you go across and all the way, basically, as far as you can see, those hills are covered in wildebeest. Covered. That's astounding. That is really interesting. Now, whether these chaps have come north from the Sand River up to this area, or if they've come south out of the conservancies, I don't know. But that is a vast number of wildebeest way in the distance. That's very interesting. Well, Jamie's not too far. I don't actually know where those Cheetah Brothers are. I suspect that they are pretty much over the top of my head down that way. But they will be very interested to know that there is that much there for them to eat. You can see Jamie has got no trouble with the rain at this stage. Which is very nice for her. Alright, we're now going to stick to our original plan, cut back towards the escarpment, see if we can find the sausage tree pride, and perhaps, uh, I don't know, maybe that female cheetah and her little baby cuppies? Who knows, maybe. Let's do a quick turn here. I don't see anything else going on in this vicinity, so I'm going to cut back there now. Rather than do too much searching around here, where we are unable to go off-road. We will now be driving into the storm, which is uh, mercifully moving off towards the escarpment, I think. So that's very pleasant indeed. It's got a bit of a Sunday feel about it out here, I must say. Right, Jamie apparently has not gone looking for elephants. She's uh, with her cheetah again. I haven't. I didn't realize how late it was getting. I should have made the decision sooner, but it's a bit late to make it now. So we're going to we're going to settle with them, and we're going to stick with them while it gets dark. And of course, once we reach around about half past six or so, we actually have them entirely to ourselves, which I feel is us being hugely spoiled. Oh, the one on the right just gave us such a sweet rollover. <laughs> hey, you. They can be very cute when they want to those white bellies showing. It's interesting to hear that the wildebeest are massing at the crossing. Last time I was in this area there were herds of 10,000 odd to maybe a little bit more and they've all slowly moved to the west and back in the direction of where James is at the moment. So it's clear they're around the crossings. Are they going, what do you think everyone? Do you think they're going to come back into the triangle? I'm starting to think they might. We did speak about it and the fact that it was one of the earliest that they'd ever left the triangle in terms of recorded history. How's the weather on James's side? Because from where I'm sitting it looks terrible. <laughs> 
it really doesn't look pleasant. I think we've we've actually largely escaped it where we are. But hold on, I'm going to just reposition to show you. Oh, D'Artagnan's looking as well. What do you say, Dart? Say? Say, Dart. Do you think James is going to get rained on? I don't think he looks like he cares. Shall I show everyone what the raid looks like? Since we... Oh, kitty cats are sleeping for now. So James is somewhere in the direction of that. I gotta say, I'm... I'm going to suggest that James is going to find himself soused. Ah, oh, for once, this side of the river, it's not us. I was, I was secretly, obviously I would really like it to rain here to keep the grass green and the animals happy, but I was rather hoping it didn't happen tonight because this is where I got stuck. Somewhere here. I'm not entirely sure where, but somewhere here is where I got stuck in the middle of the night with Manu. James has always said it's my fault that, that it always rains, so I think it's actually his fault. Ah, Fergus has, Fergus has raised a very valid point. Fergus tells me that James always blames him for the rain. Well, uh, Ferg, I think that all evidence speaks to the contrary now. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear that it's not you at all, it's James. Exactly, from the, only, the mouth of the only lawyer in camp. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that counts as legal advice, but, <laughs> but we'll go with it. Here we go. It's pelting down over there. I'm very glad I'm not there. I'm very glad I'm here. Although I shouldn't speak too soon because you never know what might come our way. There's some ominous clouds. Okay, so James, is, James has said to tell Ferg that the, the rain is heading towards the escarpment, Ferg. Does that have a specific meaning? Because it always heads there. I told him once that it was heading towards the escarpment and it turned around and hit us, so he blamed me. Oh, I see, I see. Right. <laughs> it's very pretty, though. Those trees on the horizon. Yes, many a time those storms have taken me by surprise. I don't think that's possible to predict where they're going, quite frankly. And then you'll be halfway through one and another one will hit you from the other side. And we usually try and park the vehicle so that we can shelter ourselves properly. And then you've put sort of all of your reinforcements on the side that the storms come in on. And then all of a sudden it batters you from the opposite end. Not my problem tonight. <laughs> oh, hold on, we've got one up. Oh, that's very pretty. Lloyd, you want to know why we're talking about the weather? Lloyd, you want to know how hot it is over here? It was very hot earlier. I say very hot, not by low felt standards. Oh. Ferg, I know that's very pretty, but we've got a cheater on. We've got a cheater up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, we cheated down again. Never mind. <coughs> cheated down again. You can stay. You can stay looking at the beautiful sky. Um, Lloyd, I would say it probably went over 30 today which is about as, it, as hot as it gets out here. The sun is very warm. The sun is very strong here because we're quite a lot closer to the equator, but it never gets as hot as it does in the low felt where it reaches temperatures often in summer of over 40 degrees centigrade. Here on average, it is much, much, much cooler. And we're at a much higher altitude. So it's actually a really pleasant climate. It's not, at nights get a bit chilly, but they don't really go below about 15 or 14 degrees centigrade. It's very chilly when you're damp, when you've been caught in the rain, which is why I feel for James across on his side. But it's a really very nice climate. Hey, cheetah, are you going to sleep like this? It's okay, we've made the right call. We're going to stay with him. Um, Carly, yes, most of the thermoregulation done by the the various cat species is through panting, and of course they do build up huge amounts of heat when they race off. They also lose heat through the soles of their feet, and one of the reasons why they have white bellies is so that they can present their bellies to the sun 
and reflect the light off it and bounce the light off it because obviously if they were dark in color it would be much much hotter oh, i love it I, I was saying to ferg earlier i love it when they stretch their feet out like that because it's dog like don't get me wrong i'm not saying they are dogs but it's a very dog like way of stretching their paws it looks totally different to the way in which le lions and leopards move their feet there's a massive back feet built for traction Aiden who is six years old speaking of the animals panting Aiden that's a very good question well done for spotting that it was very observant of you so Aiden spotted that the cheetah are panting and he wants to know why. Why is their breathing so hard? Aiden, it's for two reasons. One, yes, they are quite warm, possibly still recovering from the chase of earlier, because they definitely killed something earlier. So chasing down their prey, I think has made them quite tired, but also they've eaten meat. And when cheetah or lions or leopards or hyenas eat meat, they eat as much as they can, as quickly as they can, and they get very full bellies. And while their bellies, their digestive system, so their stomach and their intestines breaking down the meat, it actually releases lots of heat internally. So Aiden, I don't know if you, if you ever drink hot chocolate or something like that, and you feel warm inside, that's what's basically happening to the cheetah while they're digesting their meat. And that's why they're panting, because it's to help to cool themselves down. It's also, all of that food in their belly is pressing up against their diaphragm as well. So it's, it's making their lungs feel a bit small, and they're taking smaller breaths, because they're so full. They're not that full, though. They're still going to keep us moving tonight. Alana, I think we've, and uh, um, it's lovely to hear you back again on the Sunset Safari. Alana, I think we've seen them pretty much hunt the, the largest prey that they could possibly take down, which would be an adult wildebeest. I don't think that they could get much bigger than that. Maybe, maybe an adult zebra, but I think it would be a serious fight. But an adult wildebeest, adult topi, those are sort of that's going to be the limit of what they could catch. I don't think they would ever take on buffalo, although never say never, maybe a buffalo calf. But I just don't think it's within their nature. They definitely would hunt ostrich and definitely could hunt ostrich. But I think a um, young elant, but again, I, I think we've seen them look at them, walk past the elant, but never really try it. I think we've seen them tackle pretty much as large an animal as they could possibly manage. <coughs> I was actually quite astounded when one of them on their own took, took down a topi, a fully grown adult topi. I was quite taken aback. The rest of them came in to help afterwards, but the entire process from knocking the topi's legs out from under it to getting the stranglehold was one boy alone. quite amazing whereas females they tend to go th for things more tommy sized hmm yes Paula probably they would um, because the opportunity would be an artificial situation. So Paula's question is, if given the opportunity, would cheetah cubs play with lion cubs? And I don't think at that point the, the natural instinct of competition has really fully registered with, with the little ones. So in a situation, yes, where you've got cubs of two different species together, and it would be artificial because it wouldn't really happen in the wild, then yes they probably would play together. I think they would play together. And I'm sure if you Googled hard enough, you would find a video of cheetah and lion cubs playing together. It's just one of those things. 
Uh, so it would it would be an artificial situation. Would it happen in the wild? Let's say in a, in a very strange hypothetical scenario, mommy cheetah goes off and, and the lioness goes off and neither of them realize that they've left their cubs in the near vicinity of each other. I still think they'd play with each other. It depends on the ages as well. An older lion cub, now we, I'm talking about lion cubs, black rock, pride age, tiny lion pride, tiny lion cubs. Five-year-old or five-month-old lion cubs and tiny newborn cheetahs, I think, would be a different story. I think they'd be killed. So there you go. I'm not sure. I think it would be, it would be a once-in-a-lifetime sighting if it ever did happen in the wild. And speaking of a once-in-a-lifetime sightings, I'm sure that James has got one to show you right now. Well, funnily enough, no, that's been a once-in-an-afternoon time sighting since the end of the long rains at the end, middle of July. Uh, we've had a storm like that uh, every single day during the dry season, which has been very special uh, if you happen to like storms. If you are in a leaky vehicle, however, uh, the end of the long rains, which brought on the exceptionally long rains, has been somewhat frustrating. Anyway, gorgeous storm over there. And in front of the storm, we have got some Thompson's gazels, which Andre, rather like Veeam and Giraffe, is refusing to show me because he said to me, and I quote, they're a bit standard. Didn't you, Jean-Andre? Mm -hmm. You lie. He's denying it now. Fortunately for him, I have got the coffee and the sandwiches in front here, so he won't be having anything for supper. Here they are. Sorry about that, John Ray. Uh, let's go back to the Thompsons, because that would be so kind. Some Cokie Franklins calling in the background. And yet again, I find myself astounded by the silence of this place. You see, I told you it was quiet. You can just hear one or two Franklins yelling here and there, the odd roll of thunder, but otherwise very quiet. Ah, Larian, you want to know if Thompson's gazelles are related to the South African national an an anthem, animal, the springbok, and the answer is a resounding yes. They are. Springbok, the only gazelle found in southern Africa. And a gazelle is an antelope, it's just a slightly different offshoot, a different family. And uh, uh, gazelles in, southern, in the world, I, or at least in Africa, I will tell you, there are... I'm just quickly going to read you this. The gazelline antelopes, so long-legged, long-necked antelopes with light-coloured coat, large sensitive eyes and ears, a small mouth, and in some species, pre-orbital glands, both to, alert to both sound and movement. I think that means the uh, entire animal. I don't think the pre-orbital gland necessarily. Anyway, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, can you believe it? 16 different species of gazelle in Africa. And two of them out here. We have the Grants and the Thompsons. Favoured food. Ooh, he's going over to some ladies to tell them what he's been doing on his Sunday so that they might go, Ooh, I say, really? Harlan, I am a very sarcastic human being, so I'm going to answer your question sarcastically first, uh, which will prepare you for it, and then I will try and do it uh, not so, uh, not so uh, sarcastically. You say, who was the Thompson's gazelle named after? To which my answer would be someone called Thompson, apparently. Um, but your question is obviously, who on earth was Thompson? And I don't know who he was, but rather like Wahlberg and Birchall, I suspect he was some kind of naturalist that did a lot of exploring around Africa 
and he has lent his name to the Thompson's Gazelle. Now, what I just want to quickly do while Jandri has very kindly put the camera on to me, and it's very difficult for him to do that because he doesn't like me very much. And so uh, what I'm going to do is go <laughs> across to the Springbok over there. Uh, we don't need the text, I suppose. We want the actual animal. There's the Springbok, and you can see they look very similar indeed. Antidorcus marsupialis is its Latin name. I don't know how I remember that. It's just because it's so ridiculous. Antidorcus marsupialis. And this big mantle of white fur helps it to cope with the desert conditions it lives in. It turns that mantle of white fur to the sun and it reflects the sun so it doesn't get all hot and bothered. And let's just uh, go up to the next antelope, which is found in the Horn of Africa, simply because it has a name that I've never seen before, a dipitag. It's known as a dipitag. It's quite amazing, Latin name. Amo, Amo Dorcas Clarkii, the dipitag. Wonderful, I'd like to see a dipitag one day. Not sure I'm prepared to go to Eritrea to do it though. Ah, but we could find one in Ethiopia, which I would be very prepared to go to indeed. Uh, Jean-André, let's have one last look at uh, these Thompson's gazelles. Uo Dorcas Thompsonii. And then we'll press on. Now I believe that as the wind starts to howl onto my face and the rain threatens to assail us, it's certainly filling my nostrils now. The sun, where Jamie Patterson is, has burst through the clouds and is shining down upon her and smiling. <laughs> well, almost. Ah, oh, I've forgotten the rest of the words. It was a very good reference, and I dropped the ball. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry, um, but it is a really, it is a really stunning view that we have. Unfortunately, it's not shining directly down on us, which would be very pleasant and help to chase the chill of the wind away. Especially because I forgot that I was going to stay out late tonight, and I've only got shorts. But anyway, that's not a big deal. Um, it is really very, very pretty. So pretty, in fact, that. I think it is almost deserving of a photograph. It is definitely deserving of a photograph. So I think what you should all do is take some screenshots. It's a perfect opportunity. In fact, it almost looks as though the light should be shining on James, you know. Mm, maybe not quite. He's a bit further away than that. James looks like a tree. James looks like a tree. <laughs> um, if James were that tree, the light would be shining upon him. Beautiful. It is a really stunning evening. Especially when the rain is over there. Makes it even more beautiful. Watch it swirl round and hit us, Ferg. Because we've been commenting on it. It'll somehow come from the west. It'll be one time the rain comes hauling across the river to the west. It's very Lion King-esque, isn't it? That beam of light. I suppose we're in... we're close enough. Lion King was set in Tanzania, wasn't it? No, I know it was in cartoon land, but I mean, in theory. <laughs> in theory, it was sort of Tanzania-ish. <laughs> and Hans Zimmer's. Mm -hmm. I'll try to sit quietly. I will try to sit quietly and we can see what sounds we can hear. The wind is blowing, but it's not too bad. I don't know, Ferg, how's it sounding from your side? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> Let's find out how it's sounding from your side. I think it might just be wind. Wind and fans. Wind and fans. That's not a good combination. The fans obviously sit in our vehicle to help to keep our equipment cool. Otherwise we'd burst into flames far too regularly for our liking. It still sometimes happens. 
not often though. No, okay. It was a nice idea. It was a nice thought. Okay, good. I'm glad you could hear some of the birdies in the background. Perhaps at some point we'll be hearing the cheetahs, which sound very similar to birds. That little chirping sound. That's terrible. That was a terrible impression. Oh, lightning and all. Ooh, I don't envy James. I hope he's found himself a safe spot. That doesn't look like a storm that can be outrun. Maybe it looks worse from this angle. Oh, and just like that, we're all alone out here. Not a single vehicle, everybody's heading home for the safety of dinner. Lorena, I know, it is hard to believe that color of the sky is real, isn't it? It looks like something that somebody created or, or painted. Ferg's been splashing colours across the front of the lens. I don't know, it's just very pretty. I was, My favourite thing about the sunsets is the transition from the, the reds and the oranges to the purples. Actually, no, no tornadoes here in the Mara. We do get dust, what we call dust devils. I, I'm not sure what their official name is, which is, of course, a sort of tiny, tiny, tiny tornado where the wind whips around and, and pulls up, goes into a spiral and pulls up the dust. And you do occasionally get buffeted by them as you drive along if you don't move quickly enough. So that, that's about as close as we get. I imagine that floods happen regularly here um, when the water does come down in the rainy season. But that's to be expected. It's a very high rainfall, <coughs> excuse me, rainfall area. Fires would also be very scary here in times of drought when the grass is long and dry. Mm. And big storms. I really think we're going to experience rain like we've never experienced before and wind. I think the wind is going to be something to behold, especially up at the top of that mountain where our camp sits. Hmm? Don't forget, for people that have just discovered this live stream, you're watching this live from the Masai Mara. Which means, of course, that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Chad, you want to know how often we spend the night out in a tent? Um, never in a tent, although I suppose you could call our vehicle a tent when we put the sides down. Oh, we live in tents, we do. We do, you're right Ferg, we live in tents. Our camps, our camps site, our rooms are really, really nice safari tents. Very good point. So basically every night we camp out in our tents when we're not out in the field. We switch around in terms of the schedule. We try and play it by ear and try and do it with a little bit of common sense because obviously too many late nights makes for an exhausted crew. <clears throat> but it's usually, I would say, in terms of how often we're out sleeping on the vehicle, up until recently it was at least three nights a week that we were spending out in the field all night. Um, yeah, all night. And then late nights would be another three nights, and then we'd go shift on to a normal schedule for three days. Well, normal. Normal's all relative. That was kind of how we worked it when it was just Taylor, myself, and, and Brent. Obviously, James is back now, Scott's back now, Taylor's on leave. So we've shifted up the, the schedule a little bit, but I, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to work it now. The migration's come back, so we could, we could end up spending quite a few nights out in the field. We've got our mattresses. My only concern is I forgot about food for this evening. I'm not sure what Ferg and I are going to eat if we do stay out. Maybe the cheetah will share. I don't know what we're going to eat. We're going to have to go to Tullock and find something. 
I completely forgot to sort out food. We've got digestive biscuits. They're all one. Ah. Oh, speaking of camping out in the tent, apparently that is what, well, James has planned for his night on the vehicle. No, I most certainly do not. I am not spending the night out here. Um, we will spend until probably around 9 or 10, I guess, depending on what we can find and what happens. But then I think I'll probably make my way back to camp. I'm going to stop here. And uh, unfortunately, my animal finding skill is very poor at the moment. So what I'll show you is another magnificent sky. And then we'll look at the escarpment. Alice, is it raining back home where you are now? Alice says, it is not raining. Negative, not yet. It is good to know. There are also some elephants very, very far away, Jandre. Hold the camera steady. They're at uh, nine o'clock. And the wind still blowing and the call of the Koki Frank along. From here, I'm going to start driving at a much faster speed in order to get onto the escarpment and see if we can't find the sausage before the end of the drive, before the end of the light, basically. Are you ready, Jean-André? Can't drive too fast on these roads, though, because, well, this, this is a little track rather than a road. It's a bit bumpy. Steffi, you want to know if there's a speed limit in the Mara? There is, actually. The speed limit on the main roads is 50 kilometers per hour, which is about 30 miles an hour or so, uh, on the very main roads. And then on these roads, basically, if you were to try and drive faster than I'm doing now, you'd lose everyone out the back of the car, and your car would probably fall apart. So they don't need to set them on here. The main roads are very smooth, though, and they're very well maintained here in the Mara Triangle. And so there is definitely a speed limit. And, uh, well, you know, the vehicles we drive are unable to sort of get up to that speed limit, so we're in no danger at all of uh, being fined for overzealous speeding. Yes. And as I've said to you, of course, that the... Um, <laughs> as I've said to you before, I didn't think that I'd ever find the day where I was going to miss Wendy, Jigger and Rusty. And, uh, well, that day has arrived. Uh, we're going to go back to Jamie now. I'm going to try and find something so that the next segment I do is longer than three minutes. We'll see you shortly. <laughs> oh, James, I'm sorry. It's not intentional, we just, we have such a glorious sunset and Alice seems to be enjoying it so much. It really is quite beautiful. In fact, even the dust trail of the vehicle is quite beautiful as it races off towards home. A little bit late, a little bit late. Hmm. Oh, my eyes have got all spotty now. I've got little, little suns popping up everywhere. Oh, should probably not have stared at it for as long as I did. <laughs> it looks really pretty watching the cars drive home when the dust is shining in the sunset like this. Beautiful golden color. And back to the sunset. Ferg seems to share Alice's... Uh, I'm not quite sure I'd call it an obsession with it, but it's, cl it's close. It's close. Hmm. Now the laughing doves are calling, Cape turtle doves are calling. The cheetah, by the way, are still completely flat. They are passed out fast asleep. 
I really wonder what they have planned for me on this evening. And Fergus, are we going to be sitting here watching them sleep for the next three hours? Pollen? Um, well, let's, I think we'll, we'll have a look back at our cheetah in answer to this question. Are you wanting to know about the cheetah population um, compared to the lion population? Did I hear that correctly, Alice? And the answer to that is essentially the cheetah population is much, much lower than that of the lion population. They are more endangered than the lions are in Africa. The largest meta population of cheetah in the in Africa is in the Kruger National Park. So that is where there's one of the largest populations. Of course, the Mara has a very healthy population of cheetah as well, and a population that is increasing. So it is on the rise. I'm just gonna pop my jacket on. Sorry, it's got quite, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wasn't watching where the camera was. <laughs> sorry. And there's my jacket, now it's on. It's okay, we don't run that risk again. Um, yeah, it is, they are an animal that need that need a degree of, of awareness raised about them and the fact that they they are it is a very, very sensitive animal in terms of the numbers in the wild. Speaking of very sensitive animals, uh, James is across the river and he's deeply devastated that he hasn't had much screen time. I am very devastated and I'm also very deeply sensitive. I'm going to cough now, everybody. <coughs> and um, the reason I am deeply devastated, uh, well, yes, I failed to find anything, but I'm very sensitive, you know, I'm a very sensitive human being and, and so I, I don't like it when I feel like I'm not contributing enough to the drive by finding interesting things. Anyway, so there we have some elephants beautiful elephants and they're dotted about here in relatively large numbers. I'm going to sneak forward slightly after we showed you that magnificent sky. Come on now, there we are. We'll just get a little bit closer and there are little herds dotted all around this clearing obviously some good stuff for them to eat and this little herd consisting of what looks like two cows and a very small baby. And there she is. I'll just get the other side of the light so that it's not quite so difficult to shoot. Cheryl, you want to know about lightning and if there have ever been animals in the Mara struck by lightning. I'm 99% sure that yes, I'm sure there have been. Animals get struck from time to time. There is often quite a lot of fairly severe lightning in this area, so yes, I'm sure they have. I have never seen an animal struck by lightning, not here, not anywhere else. But I know that it does happen uh, in various parts of the world. Certainly it happens in the Kruger from time to time. It happens on the Highfelt from time to time, the Highfelt of South Africa, I mean. And, oh, yes, another little one joining. So, uh, two mummies and their little babies. I would imagine, however, that it is very infrequent. I mean, your chances of being struck by lightning are really very small indeed. Oh, shame. Oh, so tired. Need to have a little Sunday lie down. That is very sweet. Walk straight up to Mum's foot and lay straight down. I suppose also probably trying to get out of the wind. I think it a little elephant like that must get pretty cold. Just shaking off the dirt from the roots and enjoying the grass. And as we've said before, I mean, it's inevitable that with all of these animals we're going to compare them to their brethren down in the Sabi Sunt, in the Kruger. The elephants here, to me, markedly different in terms of their 
size. They are wooden, or they're as tall, but they're certainly less bulky, I think. And their tusks definitely longer and thinner than the ones we find in the Great Kruger National Park. Why that should be the case, I don't know really. Remember, all elephants' tusks, I suppose. The elephants' tusks that you see anywhere in the world are influenced heavily by the amount of, well, shall we say, uh, what's the word that I want to use? The almost holocaust, I suppose, of destruction wrought upon them by the settlers that came in with their guns in the 18th and 19th centuries and so they shot animals or elephants for the size of their tusks and so the size of tusks here uh, it's very difficult to you know tell say why they should be the lengths that they are and give some kind of evolutionary reason when we are pretty sure that they are much shorter and much smaller probably much less heavy than they were uh, in the days before the settlers arrived with their guns it really is very... Uh, the, I would love to see a count. I've never seen a, a total count. I'm sure one has been done, though. The amount or the number of elephants that were obliterated for their teeth over the course of those two centuries and into the earlier parts of the 20th century as well, of course. But you read the accounts of the old uh, hunters. Uh, I read a book once by a chap called Al Adolf Delagorg, who has been given, who gave his name to the Delagorg's pigeon, amongst other things, a fairly inconspicuous bird found in South Africa. And the I always feel I should freeze when the strap's in. Um, <laughs> The Delagorg pigeon, very inconspicuous creature found in uh, various parts of South Africa, and he has been given, you know, his his, his name has been honoured by being bestowed on a pigeon, and he, you read the accounts of the number of animals he obliterated, blasted, shot from life, and then just left lying to rot because the, they'd take the tusks or they'd decide the tusks weren't big enough or they'd decide that we don't want to track these things again so we'll just shoot them all now. It really is quite horrific stuff. Anyway, on to uh, probably a slightly friendlier fellow was Joseph Thompson. Joseph Thompson was the man who gave his name uh, to the Thompson's gazelle. He was, as expected, a British explorer but I see also that he had quite a lot to do with the scramble for Africa, which, if you happen to be an African, is not going to be something that you're going to celebrate hugely. And so I suspect he was, uh, well, much around about the same time as Delagorg was blasting elephants out from existence. I suspect that Thompson was knocking about, sticking Union Jacks in the ground and claiming ye Africa for ye olde England and Queen Vic. Anyway, it's him who gave his name to the Thompson's Gazelle. Just beautiful scenes. That sky keeps changing. It really is magnificent. Paul, we get asked this quite a lot as well. You say, do the elephants in the Mara live longer than the ones at Juma? Remember, uh, just before I answer this question, just remember that Juma is 1,200 hectares, so it's about 3,000 acres or so. It is a very small section of the Greater Kruger National Park, which is roughly the same size as the Mara Serengeti ecosystem. So when I say an animal at Juma, I mean of the Kruger, basically. It's all joined together there. You want to know if the animals of the Kruger live slightly less long or slightly shorter periods than these ones here. We were asked this the other day. You must remember... The reason Paul's asking this question, for those of you who don't know, is that an elephant dies when its teeth wear out, it then eventually starves to death. And the thing is, though, Paul, that the, and I think this is pretty much genetically determined, the last set of molars, the last set of teeth come in when they're about 55 years old. When that last set eventually disintegrates or is worn down, then the animal will starve to death. So while, yes, that last set might last longer in a place like the Mara where the food is slightly softer, I don't think it's going to last that much more. So the effect of the softer food is not going to be cumulative over the animal's life, if you know what I mean. I don't, I think, 
from my understanding that those teeth come through regardless of whether the predecessor is worn down or not. Okay, one last look at the elephants perhaps, Andre, and then we shall move along. Marvellous. There we go. There we go. Now, Jazz Buddy, quite as amazingly and quite contrary to what your question has asked, you say, do they shrink when they get older? They don't. They actually grow pretty much till the day they die. So they might get a little bit skinnier as they approach death. They don't shrink, though, like human beings. My father, who is now 70... Ooh, he is going to be 70... He just turned 74. My father uh, is bemoaning the fact that he thinks he's not nearly as tall as he once was. Um, he's tall, much taller than me still, but uh, he's not. <laughs> he, he's bemoaning the fact that the human being, unfortunately, does not keep growing until they die. I'm quite pleased about that because the cumulative effect uh, would mean that I'd probably be, well, maybe I'd be six foot now, but Jandre would be eight foot, and that would make things extremely uncomfortable in this tent where it starts to start raining. It's not even smiling. Definitely not giving him his sandwich and coffee. I still haven't managed to get across to the escarpment, but that's okay. Alice says, speaking of old age, John has a question, and that is, what is the most frightening experience I've ever had? I'm not con convinced those two things are joined. Alice, how are those two things joined? You can tell me that after I've asked John's question. Um, answered John's question. John, the most terrifying experience I've ever had was with an ex-girlfriend who... Um, uh, no, I'm not going to tell you that story. The most terrifying experience I've ever had, one I've shared very often, it's of when a leopard ended up landing on the bonnet of the car, jumped up, was chased by some wild dogs towards us, and I thought he was going to come into the car and maul the guests. And that was definitely the most terrifying experience I've ever had in the bush. Um, I'm generally quite cautious out here. I don't like to take too many chances, so I haven't had a huge number of animals um, try and impose their wills on me. I suppose some of the more frightening ones I've kind of put out of my mind. The other frightening thing for me, or the most disconcerting thing for me, was when I was taking walking safaris. And you'd bump into lions, obviously, and you'd bump into elephants and buffalo and all sorts of other things, but you never knew how your guests were going to react and for me that was one of the most disconcerting things because although I became relatively good at predicting animal behavior trying to predict human behavior that's not nearly as easy and the humans that you take on a walk and whose lives are in your hands well they tend to be a little bit less predictable than the animals you might see and I found that very disconcerting over a long period Anyway, that's my, that's my story, John. It's the reason I don't have any hair anymore and why quite a lot of it's grey. I'm not sure why Alice was talking about old age. Perhaps because she thinks I'm so old, I must have lots of good stories. I suppose we better put some lights on now. It's getting a bit dark. There we are. Not very powerful lights, of course. This being a Land Rover. John, do you, we do have the View Pro, do we? We do. We'll put it on later. Alice, are you still there? Or you're just not talking to me anymore. I think Alice is crossed with me. There she is still there. It's lucky. Paul, you're wondering, uh, speaking of danger, whether we had animals in camp. We do from time to time. We have buffalo in camp every so often. We have zebra in camp almost every night. They have been, they're remarkably well-mannered, I think, those zebra. They move out of the way. They don't let you get too close. They tend to warn you by tripping over themselves every so often. Uh, we've had one leopard calling. I haven't, you haven't heard him call again, have you, Jandri? 
Yeah, no, well, I've heard one leopard calling quite close to camp, but not, not again. And John was just saying, have I ever seen a hyena in the camp? And I have not seen a hyena in this camp. So, buffalo and zebra are the residents. Um, but, and buffalo, obviously, the ones you've got to be careful of. But very few buffalo, not, not, not often. So I'd say that this camp, because we're so far up on high, is probably less frequented by animals than the camps at Juma, which is right down on the ground. And we often have hyena in camp there. Uh, it is fenced, and so buffalo don't come in, but they're all around outside, elephants as well. All right, I believe that Jamie has decided the gaudy golden color of her cheetah was a little overwhelming and so now she's got them for you in black and white. It was all a little bit too bright for us, wasn't it? That sunset and the cheetah, I thought our eyes needed a break. That and the fact that the sun has disappeared means that we are switching to infrared. <coughs> oh, excuse me. We're going to be switching to infrared and of course for the duration of the drive we will be in infrared. Our is a diurnal well <laughs> from what we've seen not so much but as an essentially diurnal animal and really you don't really sit with with spotlights or lights on adult cheetah anyway at night and of course having this infrared for us has been a really special thing because it allows us to actually sit with them and follow them without in any way disru disrupting their day-to-day -day process. They do have eyes that are structured in a way similar to leopards or lions, so the light doesn't bother them in the same way that it does something like a wildebeest or an antelope. But either way, we don't need to. We can sit here with the infrared and watch them as they start to stir. There were a few yawns and a couple of paw licks, which then was completely... Um, <laughs> misrepresent, misrepresenting the situation because they then went straight back to sleep. So I'm not quite sure whether or not they're planning on getting up yet or if they're planning on getting up at all. Uh, typically, in the studies that have been done into cheetah hunting at night up until recently, typically they do their most moving around about the week of full moon. So the days preceding and the days following the full moon. Now tonight there will not be a full moon, but what we've learned from a cheetah and from following these particular males at night, it doesn't matter whether there is a moon or not. They march regardless and they cover enormous distances. Now I'm not sure what these boys have planned, if they're still hungry, they've eaten a little bit, they're not completely full though. I'm not sure what they have planned for their night. They might also just go get up and walk which is what they have been doing while we've been following them for hours and then they just sit down and go to sleep. They obviously have a destination in mind. Who decides where to go and why? I do not know. Territorial routes perhaps. It smells a lot like rain. Mm. It smells a lot like rain. What's coming up behind us? Nothing. I think we're okay. Marianne, no. I don't think the cheetah are going to stay here for the night. That that much I can tell you. I, I could, of course, be proved wrong. Animals have a way of doing that to us all the time. Um, they certainly look relaxed for now, but no, I don't think that they're going to stay here the entire night. I think they're going to get up and move. As I said, they've often, when we've followed them, they have often marched us miles through this area. I don't know exactly where they're going to go. I'm not sure that they're going to hunt. There are some wildebeest, but not nearly as many as back from where back where we came from, which is towards Sala's Lookout Hill, and of course on the other side where James heard about the wildebeest massing at the crossings. But there are still scattered herd of, herds of wildebeest about. I'm not sure exactly what it is they have planned for us or where they're going to take us but I don't think they're going to spend the whole night here. Paul, I think there's advantages to both. Um, so Paul's question is whether we prefer the daytime or the nighttime out here in the Mara. I definitely think that there's advantages to both. I think we've seen things that very few people ever get to see by being out at night. It really is 
and a, a privilege that we don't take for granted. And I have really enjoyed learning about the way that the animals behave. Having said that, my favorite, I, I'm, I'm human. And I've, I mean, well, some people really, really have enjoyed being out at night, and I have as well, don't get me wrong. The daytimes for me are still my favorite. I love the moment of sunrise or the moment just before sunrise as it's starting to get light. I love the colors of the Mara during the day. So I think if I had to choose, I would say daytime is my favorite, but of course, nighttime is where we get to see the most extraordinary things. So it's difficult to choose. The, it just, the Mara is just such an incredibly picturesque place that I don't think we get the sort of the full impression of it at night, but that's not why we're out. But I enjoy the daytimes. What about you, Ferg? Daytime. Daytime. Ferg says he's daytime as well. Point of view, you can't beat light. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can't beat the light of the sun in the mornings and the evenings. Oh, goodness. Hello, wind. You've been gone for a while, but you're back now with a vengeance. No, I really, I really, really do, I really, really do enjoy both aspects. Here we go, off we go, we're up. We've learned so much about the cheetah's behavior at night. It's not that I would ever complain. Okay, off we go. Um, I think it was, sorry, now that I've started the engine, I just need to turn Alice up a little bit. But I think it was Busy who was asking about whether or not I've ever interacted with wild animals. I think that that is... Zibby. Zibby? Zippy? Okay. Apologies. Right. So... I think we interact with the animals pretty much every day. Um, have I ever interacted on a hands-on hands basis? Yes. I've told this story before. What is this cheetah doing? Is it sniffing the, is it sniffing the tree there? I have mentioned this story before, so it's not a secret. That's not a cheetah. No, that's not a cheetah. That's a branch. I think our boys have gone. There they go. There they go. Um, I, I have actually held a lion cub before and played with a lion cub. Not something that I'm proud of. I didn't realize at the time I was very young. Um, and now, of course, we talk a great deal about the fact that you absolutely should never handle wild animals. And certainly not lion cubs, because, of course, those cubs are destined for canned hunting, a canned hunting end to their lives. So I didn't know that at the time. I loved animals, I loved lion cubs, I thought it was the most amazing opportunity in the world, but yes, I have. And I wish I'd known different, but I didn't, and I'm glad that I'm able to share that experience and that knowledge with all of you, so that hopefully we can raise an awareness of just how unnecessary a practice it is. Because I think tourists are lied to all the time about cub petting. No, these lions, we're helping them, we're going to breed them so that we can help the wild lions and they're going to be released or they're going to live out their days in a sanctuary. I've heard it all. Utter nonsense. Yes, I have interacted with a wild animal. A, a lot of the interactions I've had with wild animals have been during darting of wild animals though. So for various reasons, whether they need vet treatment, whether it's because they need um, they need some sort of help in some way or to be relocated. A lot of my work has been in that area. Rhino, elephant, cheetah, lions, sable, giraffe, chemsbok, brown hyena, spotted hyena. I've been present at, at the darting of all of those animals. Quite a few more than once to help out with the vet's work. Okay, let's catch up. We're gonna have to go around these croton thickets, I think. I'm just gonna use my light just to see where they've gone.
Jason, yes. So that's one of the reasons why we spend a lot of time out here at night, yes. That is when the majority of predators do most of their hunting. Uh, mainly at dusk and at dawn are the main hunting times, but throughout the night, we found that the sort of 12, there they go. We found that the sort of 12 o'clock point is usually, unless the migration's in town, is usually the cutoff point. You don't get much movement from the animals from there. I just wanna go around the corner ahead of them because I want to just double check and see if the wildebeest are around. Come back. No, they've left. Oh, they've left. All right, we're gonna catch up with our cheetah. I need to get my thermal up and running. Let's go across to James, who's got one of the smaller scavengers of the night. Well, we did have, it's just in front of us. We're trying to catch up with it. I don't think it likes us very much. There we are, it's just scavenging along. It's a little black back jackal. Please excuse the jerkiness of the shot. That has got nothing to do with Jondry. It's entirely my fault. But in order to see it, we have to zoom in and do it while we're driving. Here we go. What amazes me about these things is that they don't get killed by lions more often. They are very brave, they're very slight, and I I think they must be a lot faster than they look. Because they're not afraid to leap into a kill situation with lions, grab a piece and run away. Now a lion is very fast, a lion is not slow, a lion is, uh, it's really, is, of all the animals out here, over a straight line distance, it's probably second only to the cheetah. Uh, maybe to the leopard, but I, I mean, they, they catch leopards. I've never seen them catch one of these, and I've never seen footage of them catching one of these. So I think these little fellows are really very good at getting out of the way very fast. Still in front of us, on the road. That is the black back jackal. Now we had a question, I think, from someone called Luca. Was it Luca? Alice? Schmidt Luca, age 14, you want tips as to how to get a job in the bush? Well, Schmidt Luca, I guess the first thing for me to ask you is where are you in the world and which bush do you mean? If you want to get into a job working in the bush out here in Africa, it really does depend what you want to do. Do you want to be a researcher? Do you want to be a guide? Do you want to do something like I'm doing now, which is the sort of progression of being a guide to presenting? Um, do you want to be a, a ranger? Would you like to be part of a conservation team that looks after, say, the the veterinary needs of animals in small reserves or the burning regime in an enormous reserve like this and the overall conservation picture. It really does depend what you want to do. If you want to be a guide, and the tips that I can give you are only to just read as much as possible. Um, you know, reading as much as possible about the animals that you, that you are likely to see, well, that's the best way to learn there. As a conservationist, however, uh, you're going to have to probably get a degree. I'll continue with this answer once we've gone back to Jamie's cheetah, who are not hunting, but uh, climbing. Well, they were. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things. Um, they, one of the cheetah was right up at the top of this tree, and then as James sent you across here, it was all the way up there, as James sent you across, it jumped down again. It's... um. Sorry, I'm busy ripping gaffer tape at the same time while I prep everything quickly. Um, it's it is not it's not common to see the cheetah right up in the tops of trees. They're not good tree climbers. They can climb trees, and obviously they do. Um, and sometimes you get cheetah right up in the top of certain trees, and obviously certain individuals are more inclined to do it than others. 
And it was just such a lovely, lovely shot of the cheetah up the tree. Now scent marking, spraying. And it's, it's fascinating watching these five as they go about their scent marking business because of course each one takes their turn. And I know that it's something we've commented on a lot, but the sheer amount of urine that a male cheetah is capable of producing is actually quite astronomical. Where's number four? We've lost number four. I've got two there and I've got two in front of me. There we go. Spraying on the tree. So cool. And now they've all come to lie down next to us. Which is also quite special. Is that dart over there? Yeah. Okay. So it's not him that's missing from the group. Usually when there's a lagger, it is him. He's going to go and join the rest of his buddies. And they're going to lie right here next to us. Daniel, cheetah actually hunt more frequently, I would say, than, than most of the other predators here. And that's not because they're not successful. They've got a very high success rate when compared to a lion or a leopard, but it's because they lose their kills so often to hyenas. It means that they have to hunt to keep themselves, well, to have to keep themselves well fed, essentially. So they hunt, I'm just checking to see behind me, they hunt often, I mean, we've watched them attempt hunts about three or four in a night before they've been successful and then they've gone to sleep. Is this number five on its way? Yes, here comes number five. Lisa, usually what I've found with, with cheetah, oh, playtime. Sometimes they, they play and then they get quite cross with each other. Um, what I've found is that a cheetah needs to rest at least an hour after they've chased. When they've gone into a proper full-on chase and they've missed their kill, it takes them about an hour to recover. So it's quite a long period of time that they need for their to get their breath back and for their muscles to go back into a normal state, a normal resting state. You had a large portion of that meal, mister. Judging by that sway of the belly. There's always one lagger. They obviously deliberately made a beeline for that tree and then have now changed direction. Now as it gets dark, the wildebeest sound carries a bit further. I'm trying to listen to hear if I can pick up on any of the herds around us, but the wind is making it a bit difficult. There's one more still to, has he got up yet? Yep, yeah, there he goes. There's one more. Here he goes. There we go. Okay. Let me swing around so that Ferg can actually get a shot that doesn't involve a portion of our vehicle. And let's find out where these boys are planning on taking us. So the instrument that sits over my right shoulder is our thermal to help us fo follow them. Now, I completely interrupted James in the middle of describing to one of our viewers how to go about working in the bush. I want him to finish up with that, so let's send you back over to him. I don't think it was unreasonable at all to interrupt me with cheetah climbing trees. Uh, right, so Schmidt, look, you got back to us. You said you want to be a very specific answer. You said you want to be a guide in the Serengeti in Tanzania, a guide and a ranger. Well, ranger and guide, two very different things. Uh, a ranger is not somebody who looks after tourists. A ranger is somebody who looks after the land and the animals. Um, so to be a guide, you don't need any formal qualifications. If you want to work in Tanzania, you'll obviously have to get a work permit and you'll have to get a, um, 
You'll have to get a Tanzanian guiding license, which will not be easy as a foreigner. In fact, it will be quite difficult, but it can be done. And you'll probably have to spend a few years there before you're able to get a guiding license there as a foreigner. Is that a lion? No, it's a stick. Never mind. Um, and then as a ranger, if you want to be a ranger and a conservationist, then I would suggest that you do do some kind of formal qualification, formal degree. Because while a degree is by no means the be-all and end-all of education uh, for just about anything, it is very useful, it teaches you a way of thinking that, that is very useful if you're a conservationist putting together plans for uh, burning and you need to, you know, to be able to engage with the academic uh, literature around that sort of thing, well then it's very useful to have a degree and it's very interesting to do one. But to be a guide you don't need a degree. I would suggest, however, that you set your, your sights on uh, not, not, or not limiting yourself to the Serengeti. I would suggest that you find out which parts of Africa uh, will accept foreign guides to start with. Because, of course, if you are, I know South Africa has a lot of English guides, British guides. Um, I don't know of any in Kenya or Tanzania. It's very difficult to become a guide here if you're not a Kenyan or a Tanzanian. There is something up ahead with shining eyes, Jean-Dri. I think it is an antelope of some sort. I just don't want to terrify it to death by driving up to it in this Pantechnicon. It is an antelope. That's a wonderful picture, isn't it, John Ray? Oh, it's got a baby. Looks like an impala and its baby. Is it an impala? So far away, I can't tell. <coughs> Not quite the sausage tree pride just yet. Staring blankly at us, saying to its child, If I run, you run, see? Into the grass, quick as you can. The youngster totally oblivious of any danger. All right, let's carry on. I'm not actually sure what that is. Let's see if I can get a bit closer. It looks like it might be a reed buck, yeah. It is. It's a reed buck and a youngster. There we are. So, while I don't want to be discouraging, but look, yeah, I would spread my net a lot wider if I were you. And just find out where it would be possible as a British citizen to work as a guide in Africa. Right, so we're going to take our next road up towards the escarpment and see if we can't. I've been saying that all drive, haven't I? But we're now finally in a position where we can actually do that. As the wind begins to drive in from the north, Tremendously windy place. This. I'm hoping those cheetah are going to hunt something now. So I think we'll head back across to them. And apparently she has managed to keep up with them, Jamie, fast as they are, not as fast as Patterson. <laughs> well, luckily for Patterson, um, they've been going at a relatively sedate rate so far. Um, we uh, recently were taught a little bit by the cameraman as to which of us drive the fastest and which of us don't. I'm not going to give the list away. I think you can probably guess who, who the speediest of the various guides happen to be. I'll leave it to you to guess what the, what the conclusion was. Meantime, our cheetah have found themselves at the next gardenia, stopping to sniff and have a look. Scent mark here again. Are they going to do any climbing? I don't think so. It doesn't look like a very comfortable climbing tree, does it? This is the cheetah equivalent of updating a social media status. Checking to see who else has passed by and left their scent mark on this tree and then adding their own to it. Cheetah would be 
What have you seen? Let me just check to the right. What what social media do you think Cheetah would favour? Ferg, Instagram. I know they make chirping noises, which would suggest Twitter, but hmm, I'm going Instagram. I'm going Instagram. The server would be Snapchat. Well, I don't really understand what Snapchat is. I've got no real idea. Lions, Facebook. Lots of broadcasting happening. Leopards, Twitter. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking utter nonsense now. A beautiful tree. Really is very, very pretty. Oh, unfortunately, they are continuing in the direction of the next valley, which is a pity for us because it will mean that we could lose signal as we follow them. But we're fine for now. We're still up on the ridge. It, depends, it all depends on which way they go from here. with footing there. There we go. Adding a stream. Topping up their scent marks. It's very... It, it hasn't rained here, or at least it doesn't seem to have rained here for the last few days, but they'll actually start to... A lot of a lot of the animals, the territorial animals, will actually go out and re-scent mark after the rain. So a lot of you are saying Snapchat for cheetah. I'm, I'm, I will have to agree with you because I've got no idea. I've, I missed the whole Snapchat deal. I don't really know how it works, so I'm, I'll, I'll go with, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'll have to agree with you because I don't know any better. I'm going to go around them because they've now all moved. Oh, of course, as I do that, hold on. As I do that, they're all going to move out from this tree. Which way are we going to go, boys? Can I move? Yes? No? Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to chance it. It's one nice thing about driving around here. Oh, no, here we go. Um, which way are we going, boys? This way. Yes, this way. One nice thing about driving around this area, you're unlikely to encounter an unexpected hole. It might happen, but it's a lot easier to see because the grass is that much shorter. Let's see which general direction they're moving in. Mama, you want to know what similarities a cheetah share with domestic cats? Um, less than something like a lion or a leopard, actually, in my opinion, because they don't have the retractable claws, they, their structure of their legs is very different, uh, their body language is similar, they hiss, they can purr, which lions and leopards cannot do, um, they don't roar, which of course house cats can't do, lions and leopards can. So I guess that would be... Those would be some of the similarities. Okay. All right, these cheetah are moving down in this direction. There are lots and lots of little tommies all sleeping up in the direction that they're heading in. I can see their little shapes now. What are they looking at? They're actually looking in different directions. Potentially planning out a hunt. Thompson's gazelle, they tend to, they do tend to hunt. Okay, we're actually moving a bit further. Oh, okay. Alrighty then, fair enough. It is very open here. 
and it's still no it's not light anymore it's picking which tommy they're going to go for is the trick which is one of the reasons why I also enjoy being out during the day I'm just going to move forward slightly is the ability to actually see what's ahead of you which of course is why we've got the flare but to be able to see what's ahead of you and predict their movements it becomes a lot easier Where have they gone? There they come, they're dashing straight towards the cheetah. Hold on one moment. Just beyond the reach of our infrared. I think they're going to miss the cheetah. No, they're running away. They're running away. They're not running at the cheetah anymore. Uh, TSN, yes, the only time I've ever been scared properly was when we were caught in the wildebeest stampede. That I found very scary because it was an out of, a relatively out of control situation. Um, it's something that was most definitely a learning curve for all of us and it was I think just simply because it was in the dark the wildebeest were panicking there were a good couple of hundred no there was about a hundred thousand of them and they were swirling around us and it was very difficult to extract ourselves from the situation because everywhere we went there was another crazed herd of wildebeest running in our direction so I would say that's the only time I've been scared out here. I've had a few jump frights, if that makes any sense. And it's amazing how quietly a lion can sneak up on you. And there's nothing like all of a sudden hearing the sound of their breathing and their footsteps right next to you in the dark when we're sitting with all of our lights off. And when it's, when it's moonless, it really is pitch black out here. So I've had a few jump frights. I haven't really been frightened, but I've sort of startled. And on one or two occasions levitated slightly. So all of a sudden there's this male lion's head next to yours. It can be quite the surprise when you're watching the rest of the pride and you haven't realized there's one walking up behind you. And I think we're also, we've, we're cautious. We're cautious and we're aware of the risks out here. So we know that lions and leopards are different animals at night and we treat them as such especially because they're not accustomed to vehicles moving around them or seeing vehicles at night. Wow, okay. That was a burst of activity. Dunkman, no, cheetahs are but far from the top of the food chain out here. Top of the food chain is most definitely the lions. They are the apex predator here. Then below them will sit the spotted hyenas. We don't really see many wild dogs here, although they do occasionally wander through. But below them will be the spotted hyenas. Below that, in terms of hierarchy, will be the leopards. And then you'll get the cheetah as well. This is a slightly different situation because you've got five males all together. So when it comes to leopards, a female leopard wouldn't challenge these boys. A male leopard would and would chase them, I would expect. Although numbers have an intimidation factor that cannot be disregarded. But no, cheetahs are most definitely not top of the food chain here. They actually, in terms of the big predators, they sit near the bottom. They sit at the bottom. As it happens, though, I mean, these boys are haven't let that stop them. They chase hyenas. They're very successful hunters. It would be really fascinating to follow their future. I wonder what the next few years holds for them. Everybody's talked about a split happening within this coalition. I don't know. I'm not sure. While we sit with our cheetah in the pitch black, let's go back across to James to find out whether he's had any luck searching in the inky black. And absolutely no luck whatsoever, except to say that we have made it up on towards the escarpment. And so here we are now looking 
all the sausages, which may or may not appear as we drive. The great vastness of the escarpment in front of us is rising up like a great black wave of the ocean. Luckily, it's not going to come crashing down on my head like a great black wave of the ocean. Now, unfortunately, if you don't start the evening drive with your cats, it's a little... Oh, Natalie, what a nice question. You say, which extinct animal which I, would I like to have come across? I think there are so many. Mammoths, I would love to see a mammoth. To have seen any of the saber-toothed cats, and there were many, I mean, I know we only kind of talk about the saber-toothed tiger, but there were many saber-toothed cats, massive animals, much bigger than today's tigers. I would love to have seen one of those. I mean, can you imagine doing a Jurassic Park, walking through uh, the Jurassic period and watching dinosaurs roaming? I think that must have been absolutely astonishing to see. And for hundreds of millions of years, of course, they lived all over the earth. And, uh, you know, various suites of species were around and then they all died out and then a huge number of others came about. So, you know, I would love to have seen a Brontosaurus or a, a Tyrannosaurus even, hopefully a little bit far away from it. Um, more recently, I suppose a Quacha a South African animal, which is a, well, it's a subspecies of a zebra, which, like I, some of these big tuskers I was talking about earlier, was shot out some time back. So they would have been fascinating to me. Um, what else would I like to have seen? What about you, Jandri? A unicorn. A unicorn. That's uh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> a unicorn think what else? A what? A mermaid. John Hope would like to have seen a mermaid as well. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk to him again. Um, yeah, so I guess those would be the top ones that I'd, I'd love to have seen. So I feel like there's one I'm leaving out that I've often thought I'd love to have seen. It's not a dodo. It's the first one we all learn about, of course, that goes extinct. I think I think that's the list. The saber-toothed cats for me would have been the, the really the big ones, and the mammoth. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. James has disappeared off your screen while he was in the middle of telling you what I'm sure was a thrilling tale of which creature he would bring back if he could, or which which, which extinct creature he would see. Fergus also said woolly mammoth, interestingly enough, which I have to agree with. I also think a Tasmanian tiger, something along those lines. Saber-toothed cats, yes, sloth bear, I'd love to see a slime dinosaur live. I went back in time into dinosaur, well, that wouldn't really work with it being live and all. But you get the idea. Imagine if we did our job but with dinosaurs. Might be slightly more terrifying. In fact, it would definitely be terrifying. We'd have to change our setup, I think. And if Jurassic Park has taught me anything, it's that dinosaurs find a way. Now, Christine, you're wondering about local folklore stories, if there's any scary stories of monsters out here that make us nervous at night. I must find out for you if there's any stories specifically around this area, because I have no doubt that there are. Um, I'm sure there are, and probably based around things like man-eating lions, I would say or man-eating leopards would probably feature quite heavily. Um, I don't know of any yet. I'll have to try and find some time to chat to someone. I feel like Shaddy could tell a good story, our, our mechanic, Shadrach. Um, but I will find out for you. I know of a few in South Africa. I once... Now, I know this is ridiculous. I once saw a tokolosh. Now, I don't believe in tokoloshes. I don't believe in them at all. I don't know what I saw. It was a trick of the light. It was something. But let me tell you the story. I used to live in, a, in an old farmhouse. 
about 50 years old and uh, the the people that worked with us often um, who were who were locally based they would often mention that they they knew that a tokolosh lived around there but it was many many months later that i was walking down the passageway to the bathroom and to pass to the bathroom you had to look down a corridor that led into the main room big open main room and as I walked across, something walked across on the other side with me at exactly the same time. Something quite short but bent double with long arms. And I still have the picture very clearly in my head. Obviously I was half asleep. It was dark. I must have seen a shadow of something. I don't know. But um, I, I confess to, to making the return trip at double the speed. Anyway, the next day one of the ladies came out screaming and told me not to go around the corner because she'd seen a tokolosh. I hadn't mentioned anything about it. I hadn't said anything because obviously I scoffed at myself once it was light again. Who knows? I've also had very... I've done a few sleep outs and I think it's more an instinct of wild animals than it is anything else. Um, I slept out in the bush where obviously everybody keeps watch and I've had only once ever did I experience a complete... I, I drifted off because somebody else, one of the other guides was on watch and I drifted off and I woke up ice cold with the hairs on the back of my neck standing up on end and the feeling just would not go away and I walked around with a torch and I checked and everybody else was fast asleep and we didn't, we didn't see anything and we never found anything and I have no idea what that was about. I suspect I heard something or registered something on a subconscious instinctive level. Maybe a leopard walked past us or something like that. Now listen, I mean, I watched the Stranger Things in my tent the other night and the power kept flickering on and off and I got freaked out, so maybe I'm not a good gauge for these sorts of things. <laughs> I, I had to shut the tent and turn the lights on and they wouldn't stay on and it was terrifying. Everyone else was on drive. But no, typically we tend not to be... I know dark is a different thing and we've got this, this human instinct to be home and wrapped up safely, but typically I don't find myself afraid of monsters in the dark. I probably will when I go and research all the scary stories, though. What about you, Ferg? You were... I heard the story of the weir cameraman. The weir cameraman? Mm -hmm. Is that at full moon he becomes a cameraman? <laughs> just, where's he? <laughs> just where's he gone? <laughs> where's he gone? He's left. <laughs> the weir cameraman. <laughs> at full moon <laughs> suddenly has a desire to pick up a camera. That describes half of the Instagram generation. <laughs> okay, well, while we sit and now contemplate whether or not there are any monsters out here, let's go across to James, who is braving driving about in the dark. I am, and it's blustery and cold, and there could be monsters anywhere. I just looked behind me, and I saw Gendre, and I realized monsters are closer than you think. It's not smiling anymore again. Anyway, I was chatting to you about mammoths and the ethics of the remaking them, and how, of course, many... Well, I was chatting about, I don't know if you got that far, because of course we went black screen. Anyway, we were talking about the extinct creatures and then I said, well, of course, there are rumours that people are trying to recreate mammoths from their DNA by trying to make an embryo and splicing bits and I don't know exactly how they do it, but basically they'd implant the created embryo inside an elephant and then see if a mammoth was born. And uh, I think it would be quite interesting. I mean, it would be fascinating, but the ethics of it, of course, are, are interesting. Should we be doing that sort of thing, or should we not? Now, I've no doubt that there, we could very easily cut that debate halfway. 50% would say never, sacrilegious. 
um, those who are perhaps not quite as re religiously bent might say, no, well, it doesn't matter, it's, it's all in the name of science. Others who are uh, not necessarily religious but feel that nature should be allowed to take its course might equally say they didn't think it was a good idea or an acceptable thing to be doing, to be well, doing things like cloning human beings and <clears throat> trying to recreate mammoths. Anyway, I don't think there's, of all of those people, no matter which side of the fence you sit, I bet um, were, the, were there to be a documentary on the creation of a new mammoth, I guarantee you lots and lots of people would uh, certainly watch it and try and see what a mammoth, a living mammoth was looking like, did look like. So, quite an interesting one, uh, of course, that uh, debate brought to life by that wonderful film, Jurassic Park, and it's slightly less than wonderful sequels. Now, I'm afraid I have had no luck with the sausage tree pride at this stage. Interesting question from Dumb Shark. He says, "If I could go back to a time where those people uh, were sh recklessly shooting animals, what would I tell them?" Well, that's a really difficult one, and it's it's an interesting one because if I went back and I met Adolf de la Gorg and I said to him, "You know, buddy, although you, there are so many thousands, or I come from the future, and I'll just pretend I can." make him think that, believe me, and I said to him, you know, you wouldn't believe it, but in 120 or 200 years time, there are going to be so few of these things left that you really don't want to be doing this, and I think you'll find that if I could convince him of what the world looks like today, he would go, oh my goodness, I don't believe what I'm doing. I think they were just so ignorant of what the future would look like, as we all are. And in fact, we behave, many of us behave in exactly the same way as those original hunters did. Going and shooting willy-nilly, every time we put down the toaster, boil a kettle, get in our cars, turn the engines on, we're doing the same thing to the environment. It's just not as obvious. And because we're ignorant of the effects that it's going to have on us, we, uh, we just keep doing it. We don't think about it. We don't know what carbon um, what emissions are going to make the human race look like or what the, what are going to make the planet look like. We don't know what large-scale ag large agriculture is going to do to the world. We don't know what the uh, feedlot farming of cattle and the amount of gas they produce and the amount of land required to, uh, you know, to house them is going to do. But we just carry on doing it regardless of any kind of uh, warnings that we have. So it's all very well going back and saying, you know, Adolf, my boy, you are making a dreadful mistake by shooting all these elephants. Uh, because I've seen what it's going to do. Uh, we are doing exactly the same thing. And that's uh, the last thought I'm going to leave you with before I head you back to the slightly more cheerful Jamie Patterson and, of course, her cheetah. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. I'm com in complete agreement with James on a, on a more serious note, on a more flippant note. I remember the quote I was thinking of that I was trying to get James to say which was, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Which actually applies to the more serious note that uh, James was chatting about as well. And we're going to be with these cheetah for a little while longer. Something's caught their attention, so I'm going to follow them for a little while this evening to see where they go and whether or not they have any success. So do stay tuned and do keep an eye on the Facebook live groups. And if we do see anything exciting, we will go live and we will share it with all of you. But that brings us to the end of our scheduled sunset safari and of course that is time for us to say our farewell and our thank yous. I'm going to try not to pull my earpiece out in the way that I did this morning and instead get everything on pat. So a big thank you to the Safari Live team across both in South Africa and here in the Maasai Mara, to Alice in direct to share. Most importantly, the biggest thank you to all of you. Join us tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari. Thank you.